Hey, if everyone would make your way to your seats. Uh, I'm not sure if we do have. I think we do. No, it doesn't say we do. All right, we'll try to apologize for the late start tonight, but we had a meeting before the meeting. Uh, fortunately, our other meeting during the meeting has been canceled, and so you're only going to have to come to this meeting. I'll go ahead and call the uh, regular Destin City Council meeting, August 20th, 2018, to, to order. Um, we do not have a pastor here today, so if everybody will rise, we'll just have a moment of we, silence, we and then we'll that. be led in the pledge. We did it in the other meeting. Oh. We can do it again. Yeah, do it another time. We, can do we it have once. a bunch of new participants, so I guess we'll do it again. Moment of silence, please. Thank you very much, Kyron. All right, first thing, uh, first item tonight is a gender approval. Uh, um, I think we have a couple uh, slight changes that need to be made. Go ahead, Tuffy. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to see if we can move up the um, interim city manager contract to uh, just below the minutes, if I could. Um, the reason I'd like to see that moved is because we have uh, where we're going to, before we get to that, we're going to actually be approving um, his signature authority on checks, so I think we probably need to make sure we got a contract before we do check signature authority. You want to make a... Uh, I'll make that in the form of a motion. We have a motion? I'll second it, Mayor. We have a second. A vote. Uh, unanimous, so moved. Ms. Ramswell. Yes, I believe there are folks here that wanted to speak on item 2B, and there wouldn't be an opportunity for us to hear them until public comments, which occur after that. So I'd like to request that we allow public comment for 2B. Um, normally in a situation like that, uh, we provide that public comment after a motion is made. Does that sound yep. fine with you? Okay. That's how we'll do it. Once we uh, make a motion, we'll go ahead and have public comment before we uh, get into full discussion. And then, Mayor, uh, sometimes uh, it's a good idea to, after a CRA board meeting, to then for the council to vote on what was covered in the prior meeting. That's also an option if y'all want to put that under 2A, because I believe Ms. Uh, Evans is no longer here, and y'all could just plug that in at that time. That might make sense. So under 2A, instead of a questions and answer session with Restore Act Coordinator, which we've already have, um, at that time, do we want to entertain any motions and votes by the council? Is that what you're recommending? Yeah. Okay, can we have a motion that effect? So moved. Second. We have a motion, a second. Record. Unanimous, so moved. So we've moved the uh, city manager contract up under af after the approval of the minutes, and we will provide um, a public comment during uh, 2B. Mayor, one qu quick thing be since y'all are covering the interim city manager contract now, the resolution that I had sent in earlier to Ray, uh, there was one change made to it, and I believe I, I believe you provided a copy of that to all the council, but uh. There was a section just making it clear that to the extent the interim city manager employment agreement was in conflict with any uh, city policies or other internal city rules, then the, in, the 
contract itself would control over those items. So it was kind of a just a kind of a belt suspenders provision that we plugged in uh, that should have been in the first draft of the resolution. So. So recognized. All right. So um, let's see. Do we have a motion then to approve the agenda now as submitted? So moved. Second. Take a vote. Uh, unanimous, so moved. All right. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of the minutes. Approval of minutes of July 2nd, 2018, regular city council meeting. I'll make that motion, Mayor. We have a motion. We have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Unanimous, so moved. All right, then we're going to go right ahead, and we bumped up the uh, city manager, or the uh, interim city manager contract, and Mr. Uh, Dixon, you led that move, so um, you've got the floor. Thank you. Um, if you'll bear with me just a little bit, I, I want to tell you this before I start this, that um, I'm certainly... Um, uh, appreciate Mr. Johnson's uh, willingness to step into this position and to to uh, take on the, the task of being the uh, interim city manager. There's a couple things I, in reviewing this contract that kind of caught me off guard and, and um, if you will bear with me just a little bit and let's start off with page three of this contract if you would. And um, Number two on, on the, the, the thing is basically serve at the pleasure of the council. Um, uh, where it says no recommendations or actions taken by Mr. Johnson, as, and this is the last part of that number two, no recommendations or actions taken by Mr. Johnson as interim city manager shall be held against him when he returns to his permanent position of parks and recreation director. I don't have a problem with this as far as the the fact that you know under his normal course of duties that he would certainly return to his position but i do think that if there's something that terrible goes on i don't want to be bound by a contract that says that if he did something erroneous or um intentionally did something that was you know at, against our wishes that we would have to place him back in that position if it's one of those things malfeasance or anything else and is that basically understood with this or is it basically anything that um, and or his normal course of action that he would could go back to that position which I, I want to make sure he's comfortable in that but I just don't want to make sure that that we are not doing something to ourselves that we can't get out of if we had to well could, should we maybe hear from Jeff or HR on this provision in the contract oh, wow. yeah um, the uh, the uh, the intent of that is not to insulate him if he did something that's an ultra virus act that creates criminal liability on his own behalf or if he does something that's just grossly ne negligent. It's actually in there kind of the whole purpose of that provision is if just the council in general is dissatisfied with his general performance and they feel he's better fit for being the, uh, the parks and recreation director then and they reassign him back to that position because this actually involves the council reassigning him back to that position if he's done something that's a, a negative action i don't believe the council will go that route because it also makes it clear later on that he's at will and he could be let go so if he does something bad then uh, if you have other provisions in this contract to terminate him okay that's fine as long as as, as we have that understanding and we don't just basically have to turn our head to anything that could go on on uh, page four, um, item G, on page four, item G, um, the, the um, three paid vacation days on top of what he already entitled to under this agreement um, and, and, and under his title of Parks and Recreation Director, basically, I don't mind giving the three extra vacation days for him serving out the time, but this would go away, I would gather, whenever, if he was to go back to the Parks and Recreation Department, that three days would no longer be in effect. 
Am I right? I mean, he wouldn't get three extra days as a park restoration director for the rest of his career, right? So it's a one time. He gets the three days. Uh -huh. It's one time as a this year as a as a essentially a bonus okay. for the uh, taking on this position. All right, that's not the way I read it. But if that's the intent, then as long as we know the intent, is, is that Mr. Johnson? Was that okay? All right. All right, and page seven. Um, and again, please don't think I'm having anything to say about how much employees make because I got to tell you, I know they don't make enough, but I feel like if we're doing a contract for between the city of Destin and Destin City Council and Mr. Johnson, that should really be the only person that we're talking about in this contract. And so what we've got in here is we've got basically where if Mr. John, when Mr. Johnson goes back to his position, he would get a 15% pay raise from where he's at in his position now, which equates to about $11,000 a year. And I don't have, if that's what the going rate should be or whatever it may be, that's fine, but we, we've got a, a right now a plan going forward as to how we're giving out the pay raises. And for what he wants in here as far as, or what this contract says is basically for him to get a 15% pay increase and another employee to get a 15% pay increase, which is going just them two people alone, is going to be about $20,000. And we're talking $20,000 a year. So I don't know what that going to do to us in our scale. I don't know what that would do. And I don't have a problem with these people getting this money, but I just don't think in this contract is the right place to do it. Um, um, we are trying to come up with a interim city manager contract and I don't feel like other employees should be included in this plain and simple Jeff would you like to explain why that's in there uh, those provisions were uh, included uh, the, the 15 percent at the request of his attorney and uh, I wasn't told to negotiate with them I was just told to bring back a contract before y'all so uh, if y'all want to negotiate uh, I guess now's the time so I, I don't have a problem with the amount of money that he's, that, that he's going to be paid. I, I would guess he'd probably get $15,000 or something like that to cover for the city manager, um, you know, until we hire one. I don't have a problem with the $400 a month car allowance to allow that person to utilize their vehicle or, or whatever it may be. And I don't have a problem with making sure that we take care of, of this person in the normal way that we would take care of all the other employees when it comes time for that person to go back to their position but i just don't feel like it's right to basically put a contract out here for an interim city manager's position that covers them when they go back to their normal duties and guarantees them a 15 percent pay increase i just don't think it's right for the other employees i don't think it's right for the people that could be the assistant directors of all these these different groups or whatever it may be and i just think that what we're doing is creating a hole for ourselves that in turn the people that don't get these kind of pay increases are going to be looking at us and saying well you gave it to them why can't we get it as well <clears throat> thank you mr dixon miss ramswell you're first on the list thank you mayor um in reading that entire section i note that it says that uh, mr johnson currently has 240 hours of unused leave and that um, he can only carry over 160. Was part of this consideration perhaps because he's not going to be taking a significant chunk of time off in the next month and a half when he'd normally take it, so he's going to lose those hours? That's one way I look at it. That's, that's what his attorney uh, told me, so, and I believe that's correct, right? And, I, you know, I look at this, too, as, you know, this is a way of rewarding our employees that have skills that we need and, and want to utilize. So, you know, this is showing us that we've got someone here that is fit to serve and can serve, and uh, it's essentially rewarding them for their value. So I have no problem with it. Okay. So we have no problem with once they go back to that position, that position receiving a 15 percent pay increase because of this because basically what we're talking about is about um, 10,000 a year increase because of that mr. Dixon mr. Destin sorry yeah I I echo the sentiment of and I and I receive your points I just disagree that uh, I don't have a whole lot of heartburn over the 15 percent um, you couldn't pay me five hundred thousand dollars to sit in the city manager's position. It is, it is not a. 
I think this is a thankless job. The city manager's job is a real thankless job. Hold I mean, on, let me let me make sure. What I'm trying to explain is, I don't think that I think the consideration for him stepping up and helping us through this very difficult time is uh, is basically making sure that he gets his raise and that this is basically a part of it is just simply thanking him for stepping up because we didn't have a whole lot of great other options. Ten thousand dollars a year, thank you. Tuffy, ten thousand. Yeah. Let me recognize you. I got other people in line. Uh, you can speak on this twice. You've already spoke on it once. So save all your comments up for all at one time. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. I, don't, I, I don't have a whole lot of heartburn, so I'm going to support it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Destin. Uh, Mr. Oberdeer. Okay, so at the last city council meeting, we talked about this whole thing <clears throat> about last year we gave, the, we gave the tier one employees, we brought them up to the, the industry standard. And so then what I, and then we talked about what we were just going to, we couldn't afford to do that to the tier two employees. And I said, no, we've got to do that for the tier two employees. So even though it's going to cost us $138,000, we're going to bring all the tier two employees up to the, to the uh, standard. Um, now, I, and I don't know, <clears throat> I guess then, I guess next year we'll do the tier three employees, which I guess Lance and, and Lisa and all, and all the rest of the folks that are in the tier three, I assume. But anyway, so that, that will happen next year. And, and maybe because of what he's stepping up to doing and what she's stepping up to doing now, maybe we want to bring him up to the industry standard now. I'm okay. I'd be okay with that. But, so, but, I, but I'd like to know what, what does it take to bring them up to the city stand, to the industry standard? Is 15% too much? Or does 15% just bring them both up to the industry standard? Or does 5% or does 10% or, or does it take 20%? And, and maybe if it takes 20% and he's willing to take just 15% this year and then maybe next year when we do look at the rest of the tier three employees, he might, he might get even more than that. I don't know. But I mean, I, I just, I, I don't want to overcompensate him, <laughs> but I don't want to undercompensate him, uh, if, you, if you see what I'm saying. Thank you, Skip. Uh, Mr. Marler. The two things that I, I have no major issue with uh, the pay increase. The reason I see it this way is that uh, Ms. Firth, in, in her case, she's taking on his duties plus her duties. Well, the assistant, the assistant director is going to be taking over two, two, two jobs. That's her job and uh, Mr. Johnson's job. In the case of Mr. Johnson, the truth of the matter is we do not, we have, we have no idea how long it's going to take us to find a somebody that we'll all agree on on a permanent city manager. And that means Mr. Johnson may be here for, you know, six months, a year. We, we're not really sure until we actually get a chance to really start looking. So I think it's all fair compensation. And the reason I, I brought it up at the last meeting about the, uh, the changing of the guard was the fact that, you know, as, as, as our charter reads, we, we do hire and fire the city manager at will without anything, without any question, and I don't want anything to happen to the employees that have stepped up to the plate and let them get back to their previous, uh, previous jobs without uh, the fear of losing it. And that's my comment. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Marler. Mr. Destin, then Mr. Dixon. Yeah. Um I'll go ahead and make the recommended motion that we go ahead and adopt the um, the contract as uh, currently submitted. Second. We have a motion. We have a second, which we should have had before we had all Mayor, this discussion. Real quick, uh, the recommended motion is actually adopt the resolution adopting the contract. So if you refer Sorry. I'll amend that. So uh, I, rec I make a motion to adopt resolution 18-28. The second is agreed upon, Mr. Dixon. I got nothing further. This is, a, in my opinion, this is um, um, basically we we got a Christmas list for a contract here, and I'm not happy about it. And um, you know, I will be letting it known. And um, you know, as, as as far as I'm concerned, the only people we should be addressing in this contract is Mr. Johnson. So I'll just leave it at that. I have no problems or anything with any C employee, but I will say this contract should not address anybody but Mr. Johnson. And to give Mr. Johnson a 15% increase once he goes back to his position, in my opinion, without checking to make sure that that person is not going to leapfrog another person that's been there for longer or whatever may be in the same position, in my opinion, is ludicrous. I'll be voting on, no on this, and I am not done with it. I can promise you. Thank you. Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
I too would have liked to have seen um, that item uh, seven in a separate contract. Um, I don't think it should be part of our, this contract. Um, but it's my understanding that um, Mr. Johnson has put this in his contract, this 15%, um, because he's been promised time and time again over the years um, of an increase and has not received it. And so part of getting, getting what he, he's been promised and it's, it's, it's being put in this contract. So uh, for that reason, I'm going to support it. All right. We have a motion and we have a second. We've Mr. had. Mayor, does Mr. Burns have to read this in? And read uh, this Mr. In the Burns. Resolution? No, uh, no, I don't have to read the resolution, but we do have to allow public comment uh, because this was originally going to be a blue or, or a yellow card uh, item on the agenda. So I guess if there's blue or yellow cards or if anyone from the public wants to. We want to always give our public plenty of time to speak on any issue that's uh, important to them. So is anyone out there would like to have a comment on this particular uh, uh, issue, the uh, contract for um, our interim city manager and the new uh, parks and recreational uh, interim directory? Go ahead, ma'am. Just remind everyone, just state your name, your address for the record. Teresa A. Bear, 716 Main Street. I've worked with Lance for the last three years, and I have seen him work tirelessly for a crazy low income. And so I think this is well overdue, and I think with the amount of employees that have left the city, there are several people covering three and four positions right now, and there's a lot of thankless work being done and a lot of long hours. People are not leaving at 5 o'clock at the city like they used to. So this is well-deserved, and I'm glad that the other person's in the contract, too. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Ed, come on up. State your name, your address, seeing how you're new to the process here. Mike Buckingham, 510 Calhoun. I'd just like to say that I've worked with Lance since Moby Dick was a minnow. <laughs> guy's a great guy. And the old saying is you're only as good as your employees you have working for you. He's a great man, done a great job for this city. I can't remember one time anybody's ever questioned him. Well deserved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckingham. Mayor, if I could, please. I'm not going to make a comment. The only thing to say is that I have absolutely 100% faith in our city employees. I just think this is too much. So thank you. All right, Mayor. I'll no more chances, Mr. Dixon, on this particular Mayor. subject. <laughs> just I say that in jest, my friend. Real quick, our, our Parks Department is one of the few areas in a city that seems often very dysfunctional, but they're one of the few departments that can really shine. And um, I, I, I believe in both of these. 15% uh, raises is this contract the best way to establish that maybe not but you know it gets a job that needs to be done done in my opinion all right so we've had public comment we've had plenty of comment here uh, I think it's time to take this to a vote we have a motion to approve ordinance you want to read it 1828 resolution 1828 so let's go ahead and vote folks Five to two, yeas have it, so moved. All right, and um, so now we're going to do uh, under item two, seeing how we've already had our question and answer session, and I'm thankful that my questions were answered there at the end. She did a real good job. Uh, do we have any motions uh, by the council uh, uh, concerning uh, recommendations uh, that came out of the CRA joint meeting? I have them all highlighted, the ones that did come out of there. Uh, if you want me to read them all and save you the time of doing that individually, or if any of y'all don't like one of them, then I guess. I, thought, I think, we, I mean, the motion I made during that meeting was to do one through seven. So if, you, if we just want to do. Is that what you want me to do, is make the motion? Th those are the only ones I actually checked coming out as a full recommendation from y'all. Anyway. So if you want to read those seven, and then I'll make the motion. Um, the council hereby moves uh, to recommend that handicapped parking preferably be moved to either Willing adjacent property owner or Marler Street parking lot. 
further moves that the sidewalk above bluff grade be moved to not affect any existing trees on the property or adjacent properties further moves that the bluff be maintained and that a gradual ramp be constructed along the west property line all the way down to the harbor boardwalk allowing for switchbacks running perpendicular Further moves that the bathrooms and the resource room stay on the lower southern part of the property and be incorporated into the bluff with and further moves that there be not be any shades or canopies on either left or right side and further moves that the bathrooms and the bandstand be designed to face due south and further moves that they incorporate more of the park elements above the bluff grade and all the motions I just made would be incorporating motions that were made in the Harbors CRAA board meeting from, I believe it, July 11th? July 11th of 2018. So moved. So moved. We have a motion. I'll second it, Mayor. We have a second. <clears throat> and we have discussion. Ms. Ramswell. I have a question. Wasn't one of those um, motions that if the redesign went over 30000 to send it out for a rebid? That was not one of the seven motions uh, that I highlighted, but uh, I think that was included. So there must have been eight. So uh, that was included in not, that wasn't one of the two excluded motions. So. Sure, we can do that somewhere. Uh, Mayor, the only thing I have is what I mentioned at the other other meeting, that uh, make sure that Parks and Recreation uh, committees are involved in that. So we have a motion to approve motions one through seven. We have a second. Any further discussion? I apologize. It was one of the one through sevens. I just missed it when I was reading over it. So uh, so it was also further moved that if it's over thirty thousand dollars, that you recommend the designs get sent back for a rebid. You good with that, Skip? Second. Okay, with the motion second. So, so that's our motion. Seeing no further discussion, let's go ahead and take that to a vote. Mayor, I'm going to abstain. Uh, I'm related to one of the litigants concerning the park. Um, we so moved. All right, we're going to move on to item 2B, request by Point Mezzanine LLC for a 25-foot setback waiver and proposed public benefit for Point Resort Docking Facility. In parentheses, this item does not constitute a commitment for approval of the proposed docking facility. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and we will start that presentation. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you very much. Matthew Trammell, Taylor Engineering. Let me grab the So just a, a very brief reminder, we saw you a couple months ago um, on the same exact project for full disclosure. None of the information has changed. The, the presentation is still the same. We're simply here, just as the agenda item stated, for uh, approval from City Council for our proposed public benefit related to a private marina facility offshore of the old Point One, currently Point Mezzanine, Point Resort property immediately adjacent to Noriego Point. So uh, state permitting 101, uh, because the marina is a private facility, meaning that it's tied directly to the Upland condominium, only Upland condominium owners uh, can be owners of those marina slips, the state requires us to put forth a public benefit in the uh, on the order of 10 percent of the value of the marina and i'll get into those specifics a little bit further but just to give you a little bit background before we before we move forward um, so and and again we we do have a couple options here when it comes to that public benefit a number of projects have simply taken the 10 percent of the value written a check to the state um, they've checked the box they've moved on constructed their project and all is well and good uh, we have that option here. We've, we've called the state. Um, we've run over a few alternatives. You know, what, how could we best benefit the city, be good neighbors, be good stewards to Destin Harbor, and propose a public benefit project uh, to keep those dollars here? You know, once the check is cut to the state, 
the city doesn't have a lot of control as to where that money goes. Um, with this proposed project, what we've heard preliminarily uh, from, uh, from the state regulators is that if we do get the buy-in from the local government, um, we get buy-in from the property owners, we can march forth this proposed benefit to the governor's board and cabinet where it ultimately will be approved. So um, I want to be very clear on that point as well. They are the ones that make the ultimate decision, the governor's board and cabinet. As you'll see in the presentation, we've gone well beyond what's the minimum required, this minimum 10%. So we feel we're a little high on our uh, real estate valuation for, for the marina itself. We've not given you 10%, we've given you a total of 14%. Um, and we feel we've laid out some, some pretty nice items, again, uh, to roll in the biggest benefit we felt for the city. So just a quick outline. We're going to run over a little history. I think you're all very familiar with the project location. Again, it's the old Point One property. Uh, here's a little zoom up of some existing conditions. Uh, the city's 100-foot right-of-way that was deeded over as a part of the, uh, the existing development order. So it's actually split into two parcels. The upland parcel, I believe, is Point Resort LLC, and the seaward parcel, uh, a similar name as well. But um, it is the same owners, uh, just separate LLCs. And, and I will draw your attention to the riparian lines. These are the property lines that come off the corner of the property, um, often to the offshore contours. They are a little bit odd. Riparian lines can be uh, quite finicky. They can only be drawn by a licensed surveyor in the state of Florida. We've had two independent reviews by these particular property lines, so we, we feel pretty confident that uh, we got it right. Uh, so diving into the history, this is not a new project. Um, for those of you, perhaps maybe just Mr. Marlow was here on the council at that time. Uh, there is an existing development order. Uh, it was issued in 2009 for a 79 unit condominium. Uh, it did include uh, an associated uh, marina originally that was later redacted, but um, many of the documents refer to a, a 50 some odd slit marina. Uh, it's currently extended to May 20, 2022. Uh, the original project was applied to DEP in the state was a 51 slit marina, approximately 500 cubic yards of dredging, you know, somewhere on the order of about 30 dump trucks. Uh, it too was a private facility, so it, it too required the public benefit. And as a part of the development order, they were required to deed over the 100-foot right-of-way um, for their uh, public benefit associated with the DO. For the public benefit associated with the marina, they had proposed building the restroom facility on Noriego Point um, and dredging Destin Harbor, very similar to what we're currently proposing. Um, we would have liked to do the same thing. The state beat us to it on the, uh, on the restroom facility. So here's just a, a quick site plan you can see that uh, north is actually facing into Destin Harbor or the top of the page. Um, that's the, the roundabout that's proposed in the 100 foot right of way. Uh, here was the original marina that was proposed and I don't want to go into too much detail here, just, just stay about 10,000 foot with me if you can. Just pay attention to the layout of those docks. We really wanted to uh, follow the existing authorizations. Um, this marina had actually gone through the DEP and the core permit process. It had gone all, all through all the reviews, it was deemed complete and acceptable to the state. Um, it was around that time of 2010, property owners lost the property. Um, the marina application was actually withdrawn, but there was a letter from the state that if an application was made within the following 18 months, um, the, the, the marina permit would be issued by the state. Um, you know, the economy didn't rebound as quickly as we had all would have liked, uh, so that uh, basically went into abeyance. The property was held by a number of, number of other entities before uh, the current owner picked it up. So this is showing the dredging area. Um, the only reason I'm showing this is just to give you a scale of what's changed out there over the last seven to 10 years. We were originally proposing a very small amount of dredging, and you'll see in a minute um, that has increased quite substantially. And again, just an, an overview of the, the same dock layout. The proposed facility, uh, again, uh, 50 slips. Um, the slight difference here is what they were proposing originally was uh, anywhere between 40, 60, 70, 80 foot slips and a couple hundred footers. Um, the economy was very hot in 2004, 2005 when this marina was originally proposed. It's a little different. Um, marina market has slightly changed, uh, so we've scaled that back. You know, we're we're still looking at those higher end vessels, but you know, not quite that uh, not quite that extreme. But what we have proposed is somewhere around 400 linear feet spread throughout the marina 
that for flexible mooring, these are more transient slips where if we have that, uh, that owner that wants to come in and bring his fancy boat, you know, we can make those accommodations. The dredge area has, has gone up substantially where it was around 500 cubic yards. We now have 9,000. So that just shows you the amount of windblown sand that's coming over that point one parcel depositing into Destin Harbor. That's all natural. Uh, and the marina is going to be a high-end facility. You know, we're really trying to wow some folks. Uh, it's going to include all the amenities you see at all the other high, -end, um, high marina. And again, because it is a private facility, we're required by the state for the public benefit. So um, just a quick layout. You can see very similar to what was originally proposed, if not identical. Uh, we've just made some, some minor tweaks here and there. Uh, I, I do want to draw your attention because we're talking about the 25-foot setback waiver. This is the specific area we're talking about. We do not have any um, fixed structure that's within, nor are we proposing any vessels within the city's property. All of the fixed structure and all of the, this one transient boat remains on the applicant's parcel. It's just simply within 25 feet of the property line. That is a transient slip. It's, it's a flexible mooring slip. So if someone wants to come in with that 70, 80 foot vessel, we can park them there at the end of the slip. Uh, we do not anticipate, anticipate that being a permanent slip, um, more of a transient use. So I just want to keep, uh, keep that in the back of your mind. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Is that the emergency dock? No, sir. No, okay. sir. I'm, I'm getting to that. <clears throat> uh, so here's, here's the proposed dredging area. Um, again, all we're doing is proposing to dredge seaward of the bulkhead. That bulkhead was originally proposed to be the delineation between the upland property and the marina. Uh, we just had a huge amount of sand that's accumulated offshore of that. Uh, the environmental benefits and reviews, uh, a lot of us aren't that familiar with marina projects, but I can assure you anything permitted in the state, we do a very thorough environmental review. We've done water quality assessments within Destin Harbor, sediment quality assessments of the material we're trying to pull out. Um, we've done uh, independent engineering review of the hydrodynamic assessment that was done. That's the flushing analysis to make sure we have enough tidal circulation. We're not going to get any dead zones. There are no seagrass, wetland impacts associated with this. We haven't made a decision as to whether or not this is going to be concrete pilings, timber pilings, but regardless, we're going to make the, uh, the treatments to where they are non-leaching. The piles will be wrapped in plastic if they're not uh, concrete. Again, uh, sewage pump out facility will be provided on each dock. As a part of the city's permitting process, we're required to pay an MPEB. That's environmental benefit, not public benefit. Uh, that uh, it results in $420 per slip. We estimate it high. You know, I have the, uh, it's 50 slip marina with that additional flexible mooring dock. Um, so we estimated, you know, we could have an, maybe an additional five slips in those areas. So we've already cut the check for $23,000 to the city. That goes into the city's stormwater kitty, specifically for water quality improvements in Destin Harbor. Um, the permit fee, when we have all our permits, when we're actually going to construction and the owner pulls his construction permit from the building department, uh, we're required to spend 25% of the building costs. Um, we're estimating that currently at about a million dollars. So the city, on top of what we're proposing, is going to be receiving about a $250,000 check. Again, just an estimate, um, but it's going to be on that order of magnitude. Uh, obvious public benefit, we're not going to be constructing in the middle of, of the summer season. Um, all required parking. <clears throat> That's fine. Um, all required parking is going to be contained within the upland parcel. Uh, the state has specifically requested that information. They've seen a lot of uh, interest with public access, uh, parking requirements. Um, we have made those assurances within the permit. We expect uh, the permit will require that all of the slips, uh, all of the associated parking will be required within the upland parcel, not on uh, the city's uh, public parking spaces. Um, again, the required setback, while we are within 25 feet of the property line, we are not on the city's property. Um, and then the DEP required public benefit that I alluded to, it's 10% of the appraised marina value, which is about $4.7 million. There in turn, we have a requirement of $470,000. So now, yeah. Yeah, I know, and I, I'm going to jump back just for one quick second. You said that there was no direct dr discharge into the sewer. So where would the sewer be? We're where actually, does it go? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, we reached out to Destin Water users. Um, we are not allowed to discharge 
marine sanitary device effluent into the city sewers, so we're going to be containing that on an upland containment system, and the applicant's going to be paying to have that pumped off and hauled off and taken to the county's sewer plant, North County. <clears throat> that answer your question? Answer my question. Thank you. Um, so our, our proposed public benefit, and I have some figures following this, uh, the life safety rescue access dock, um, approximately 8 foot by 110 foot, you know, we're, we're proposing to build basically to commercial standards. Um, what we're proposing to fund is the design permitting construction, very similar to Noriego Point. We're proposing the infrastructure. It's the city's response uh, or responsibility as to how you manage this infrastructure. Um, estimated costs somewhere around 800, or excuse me, $80,000. Uh, the Destin Harbor dredging, this was the big one. This proposes to remove the hazardous shoals within the harbor entrance, increase navigational safety, um, increased tidal circulation. We see on the order of a four to five percent increase in the volume of water circulated within Destin Harbor with this dredging. Um, we're proposing to remove around 40,000 cubic yards. Um, again, we're what the applicant is, is proposing to fund is the design, permitting, and construction of that. So the, the project will essentially uh, be done and estimated costs on the order of 580000 I think I provided a breakdown of each one of these costs in the, uh, in the agenda item. Um, so when we were looking at these, you know, we, we didn't just say, oh, you know, this is what the previous applicant had proposed. Sounds good. Let's, let's march it forward. We reached out to the state. I'm fully aware of, of all of the issues. You know, Taylor Engineering was the one that authored the City of Destin Reconnaissance Report on Management Concerns in Destin Harbor. This was one of our proposed alternatives or one of our recommendations. Um, I hear a lot of complaints about the congestion in Destin Harbor, a lot of concerns with water quality. Um, this was meant to address those concerns. I think the, the guys who originally proposed this, this was, you know, they, they got it right with, uh, with the proposed dredging. Um, it doesn't seem like it, uh, or perhaps not, um, to someone who's not out there uh, as frequently on a daily basis, but uh, hopefully I can um, do a little bit more to convince you. And also, you know, there's been a lot of discussion of city needs a, a, a city marina. We need more fishing tournaments. We need more higher end clientele. Um, I think this project proposes uh, a lot of those those benefits. So here is the, um, the life safety access dock. It's immediately, uh, um, and this is the proposed concept for the Noriego Point recreation amenities. Uh, the, currently the restroom is proposed right uh, off the, the northwest extent of the roundabout. This, this is the 100 foot right of way and the proposed um, roadway and parking improvements, the marina. Uh, there's the property line. The, the the life safety dock, we figured having it located as close to roadway access, an ambulance could pull up right there at the, uh, at the roundabout, um, a, a vessel could come in. There's not a lot of room. Let's say we wanted to move this to the northern end of Noriego Point, not a good idea, too much boat traffic, anywhere along the harbor shoreline, we can't. That federal navigation channel, that would be an extreme permitting challenge to say the least. Um, what we've done here is minimized the, and, and I should say, this, this is going to have somewhat of an adverse impact on, on these vessels that are navigating in this, uh, this docking facility here, but we have to stay a minimum of 75 feet off the federal navigation channel, and that's exactly what we are here. Um, but I do feel our next item, the proposed dredging, uh, should address that as well. So right now in the harbor, these red areas <clears throat> are areas where we have sand shoals that are natural, that have been there forever, um, that are on the order of negative five to negative six feet. These are areas that most boats can traverse across. However, uh, the American Spirit, the pirate ship, um, your larger dolphin boats, you will see them travel that navigation channel because they have to. They can't traverse over those shallow shoals. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon when all of your boats are coming in Destin Harbor, that big, um, that big dolphin cruise boat hangs a hard left and hangs directly over to AJ's and all of a sudden the pontoon boats don't really know what to do. They're, they're confused as to which direction they go. So they, some go straight, some go left, some turn right. Um, that causes a lot of navigation congestion right there at that, uh, at that one particular location. So I'm, I'm about finished this just to wrap up. I uh, just wanted to 
show you what we've done in the past year with Noriego Point. Uh, it's no secret we were the ones um, working on the Noriego Point stabilization project. Hopefully you can see this better in your, uh, your iPads there, but that Federal Navigation Channel had all but closed off about 30 to 40 feet of the Destin Harbor entrance um, pre-construction. And that's after we were dredging every year to try and keep up with that. Um, you can see the stabilization, the framework, the sheet piles in place. This next picture shows the actual rock in place before the dredging. That, that shoal had actually grown over even further, but I also want, to, want you to pay attention to these sand areas that are immediately adjacent to the navigation channel. This, the sand dune had actually grown in to the navigation channel directly across from, that's Margaritaville or um, something over there. So, but this, this final photo, post-construction, we've got a 30, 40 foot wide barge and tug parked south of the navigation channel between there and the shoreline. So we've really done a great job at widening that entrance channel. However, the problem still persists. You can see it clear as day, that shoal right here in the channel. And what it all came from was the Corps of Engineers doesn't like, not to badmouth the Corps, they don't, mean, they don't like to work harder than they have to and spend more money than they have to. So those shoals had always been there. They said, the easy thing to do is just let's just make this dog leg and we'll just fit it right in the channel. That's the way it's always been. Um, that's, that's the same condition we're dealing with. So final slide just to show you, this was in April, um, you know, from our original presentation. I didn't want to change it. I tried to get out there with the 4th of July memorial, but I didn't want to deal with that. This is what your recreational boaters see as they're coming in, they're coming in the harbor. The general rule as you're coming into port, red, right, returning, you should always have those red markers on your right hand side if you're, if you're within the channel. Right now, a pontoon boat sees danger, shallow area, green, red, 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 all basically in a straight line. It's, your general layman doesn't understand what that means. And all of a sudden, you've got charter boats that are cutting in, and they know what they're doing. The rest of us, or the, the rest of the, uh, the rental fleet, so to speak, doesn't, doesn't necessarily understand that. So that's what we're proposing to fix. Just imagine if we had red, green as a runway straight down the Destin Harbor. Um, that could easily be achieved if the dredging was performed. Uh, you could make a call over to the Coast Guard station, say, guys, come over and survey. If we have the navigable depths, will you relocate the temporary channel markers to mark that, that temporary channel? And that's what they'll do. Um, the, the Federal Navigation Channel and East Pass, you know, Captain Jarvis will tell you, it's, the channel markers are very rarely marking the Federal Navigation Channel. They mark the available deep water. They don't mark the permanent channel. So um, by doing this dredging, we could easily, within a, a very short period of time, I'd like to think on the order of a month or two, have these channel markers relocated to where we had a straight shot right down the center throat of Destin Harbor. So um, I, I lied. This is the final slide. So to recap, I've just uh, shown you uh, what we're proposing. Again, we're required to put forth that 470. At the end of the day, including the $250,000 permit fee, we're going to be very close to a million dollars that the city is seeing uh, in the benefits that, that are proposed. So if you have any technical questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. I know that was a lot of information thrown at you. And I have uh, Joe Winkler, uh, representative for the owners, and um, Mr. William Harrison, legal support. Thank you very much. Or, but, but and, don't, and it, don't go away. We got a. I got a list of folks that probably want to ask questions. So, and if you're not the one to answer it, then the other we'll gentleman can. Up. Uh, first up will be Mr. Dixon. <clears throat> Coffee. Hello. Um, first off, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have discussed this with Mr. Winkler. There's a couple things that, that uh, on the presentation that I do have questions about, and one is the rescue dock. The rescue dock, I was in the rescue business for 32 years, and I will tell you straight up that if somebody's injured out there, they're going to put them on a boat that pulls up there and take them across to the harbor. They're not going to run the ambulance all the way out to the end of Holiday Isle. They wouldn't want to do that. The rescue dock, in my opinion, will be a dock that will be utilized by the, um, by the people that are, have the, the yacht basin there within time. So 
a rescue dock, in my opinion, and now I'm sure that every law enforcement agency, every fire department agency, every EMS agency has got a letter to you saying, we'd love to have a rescue dock, but if you ask them for 25 rescue docks, they'd say, we'd really like to have 30. So just so you know, they're never going to turn down something like that. But truly, what's going to happen if somebody gets injured out there or wherever, they're gonna load it up on a boat and they're gonna be taken to the Coast Guard station or they're gonna be taken to where the ambulance can pull right down there to get them and it's not gonna be a rescue dock situation. I can't imagine that we would need a rescue dock for here. So, you know, and that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the majority of what I see, the area that's gonna be dredged is gonna to be to benefit your project. And it's basically from the biggest area that I've seen that is to be dredged is directly in front of your project. So in essence, you know, I, I don't know that you could really call that such a public benefit is to benefit your project. And so with that, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, I'm, I don't drive a charter boat through there. And, and I'm sure that, that there is, it is tight and I know there's more uh, uh, pontoon boats and wave runners and everything else, but I really, I don't, I, I, I haven't heard that big of a, a deal about the channel that's going into the harbor. I do know there's some shallow areas, but the areas that you're talking about, a pontoon boat or a 25 foot boat can go across those areas without any problem. What we're talking about is bigger boats, the bigger boats use the channel. But I do think that with the dredging that you propose there, the, the most it's going to benefit is your project, you know, and, and the rescue dock, in my opinion, it, it, I would rather, much rather see something else besides that because I know full well it probably if it's used one time in 10 years and that would be for even a minor injury, I, I'm just shocked that it would be used at all. So I would like to see us work on other benefits or anything, anything but that, to be honest with you. I, the dredging I may be able to live with, but the rescue dock is something that it, it will not be utilized. It'll just be money spent on something that's gonna be utilized for something else. That will never be anything other than a place for people to dock their boats, so. Would you like me to address those? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, so first, for the, for the life safety dock, uh, that was actually a, a proposal that had come out in our discussions with the state. They wanted to see some form of response out there on Noriego Point. Um, Secondly, the dredging, uh, and, and also we do have a letter from the sheriff's office, and I believe Joe can, can tell you some other folks. Um, but it also could serve, and, and I believe they had made a commitment, please correct me if I'm wrong, that if the sheriff wanted to keep their boat, so instead of the sheriff utilizing the valuable public parking space at the co-op docks, um, the, the, the city's public slip over there, the fire rescue dock, whatever it may be, the, the owner would provide parking within the development order and they could just simply keep their boat moored there just to keep the congestion out of the harbor. That, that may be an option. That's a 110-foot dock, I believe, but Sheriff's probably got a 25-foot boat. Sure. A again, we're just here to provide the infrastructure. If, you know, we'll be happy to scale that back. Um, I'm not trying to muddy this up. I want you to know. I just, I just no, know I, that, I understand. that if, we're going to, if, if we're going to get a benefit out of this, that's certainly not the benefit, you know. And, and, and keep in mind too, it's the state that has the ultimate approval, the governor's board and cabinet, they're gonna be the ones to buy off on this and that was one of their recommendations. Um, so we, you know, we need to keep those folks happy as well. As far as the dredging, I do want you to pay close attention to this. Um, the 10 foot contour, the eight foot contour, they're well north of the marina. We do not need this dredging. If this public benefit is not, not approved tonight, the dredging doesn't happen, the marina will be fine. We do not need that for this marina. And I, I can understand um, it, it does appear that way, um, but it, you know, this marina is not contingent upon that dredging occurring. It is contingent upon the dredging along the bulkhead, um, absolutely, but we're doing that regardless. Uh, but, and I do understand you know, perhaps there aren't a lot of comments made that, oh, that's a bad navigation channel. I, I personally hear a lot of complaints about the congestion. And I think what it is is from being out there, they all come in the harbor and as soon as they hit the dog leg, they slow down. And now all of a sudden you have this backup situation, just like you do in a roundabout. All of a sudden, if someone sits there at the roundabout more than a minute, you now have a traffic problem, so. 
<clears throat> thank you very much. Next, uh, first, Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I mean, I, uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Dixon on the, on the dock um, with everything he said about that, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, the, uh, the sand with, that you're talking about dredging out in the channels, where would that sand be deposited? Very good question. Uh, and I, I don't know this. I know this was in your agenda item, but I want to be very clear on all of these. The design and permitting is proposed to be funded by the applicant. These are city permits. That's basically it's it state sovereign submerged waters, but the city is easily the uh, the closest nexus for being the permittee. Very similar with the beach restoration projects. You would be the permittee. You would be the ones to determine where the, the best use of that sand is. We're talking about 40,000 yards, possibly more. Um, we can't even fit that on Noriego Point if we tried, let alone that small piece of parcel that's the Point Resort. So we've not gone that far to propose locations. That's really for the city. Mm -hmm. um, and a comment on the, as far as the channel, um, you made a comment yourself that um, when a charter boat comes through that channel and makes that dog leg left to the left to stay in the channel, that pontoon boats go to veer and darting all over the place trying to get away from because they don't know what to do. Um, that's because they don't know the channels. They don't know what the markers are for. So it really doesn't matter where you put that channel and where you, if you make it straight as an arrow through that harbor with markers, they're not going to be in it. Um, they don't know what, it, what, it's, what it's there for. They're all over the place. I'm out there on the air about every weekend. Um, all those charter boats, uh, they go right across that one shoal to get into Harbor Walk um, around the old L dock that we all know it about. Um, so, I mean, to me, it's not a benefit, um, you know, to try to straighten that out. Um, and I'm, I'm with Mr. Dixon on, uh, on that dredging as well. I don't see that a benefit to the public. Um, I don't know what the... I don't know what I'd get out of it. I don't know what the general public would get out of it. Um, and uh, the parking for the marina, um, you said it's going to be on the south side. What type of parking structure are we talking about? I can't answer that. It, it was all covered in the existing development order, and I'm, I assume it's a parking garage underneath the condominium. So you will build the, the marina with a parking garage and then come back and build a condo on top of the parking garage? No, the, the marina may come, you know, shortly ahead of time, um, the, or the condominium may come first. I, I don't know which one is going to be constructed first, but regardless, the parking that's required for the marina will be provided on that upland parcel. If there's, if there's boats in the marina, we will be required by the state and the DO to provide that parking within the upland parcel. I'm just afraid that the marina will be built and then there will be crush and run gravel, whatever you want to call it, put out there and parking established um, out there, you know, for that marina. And then later in time, maybe the condo is built, maybe it's not. Um, that's just the concerns I have and what I've been getting back from the general public. Um, that's all I have right now, Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Ramswell. Thank you. Um, so to start, I'm going to sort of start where Mr. Braden left off and build on the parking question. <clears throat> so um, you mentioned that the parking would be included in the surface parking that you were discussing that would be utilized for the condos. Is that correct? Yes. So that would be the parking that was listed in the DO. I can't speak to those items. Uh, perhaps Mr. Winkler can or, or Mr. Harrison, but we will not. No one will be using that marina unless there is parking that is provided in the upland parcel that is uh, consistent with all city code and pursuant to the DO. Okay, so. That leads me to, I guess, two other questions. One being, um, which DO are you referring to? The one from 05 or the one from 09? Uh, it was the one that was in the presentation, Ms. Ramsey. I, I... That would be the 09 development order? 
with the project labeled the Point Beach and Yacht Club? Yes. Mr. Winkler, would you like to address that? Because now you're getting outside the engineer's expertise. Yes, it's uh, the development of Joe Winkler. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, the development order from 2009. Okay, so the parking that you're talking about, would that be for transient slips in the marina? No, it's all, it's all the the all the parking uh, for for the for anything that has to do with the marina. You have to be a property owner within the condominium for to be able to utilize the marina or own a slip or anything. Oh, okay. I guess I was just a bit confused because he'd mentioned that obviously the city needs a marina, and we've been working for trying to get a public marina. So I, I think wasn't... he was just talking about the, the area in general, ma'am. This is a private marina tied to the to an upland development, and there's no no public use. Okay, so That's, then my next question would be um, this development order for 09 specifically excluded a marina. So how, how are you bringing forth a marina attached to a DO that specifically excludes a marina? Uh, we would be bringing, we're bringing back and prosecuting the permits for the marina for, for this development order, and it's as, uh, as provided by for Mr. Harrison. Clarify that for a minute. Um, to tie the, to bring the, to, to obtain the permits from the core and the FDEP, and to get a, the approval or the non-approval of this uh, proposed public benefit from this board, in order to proceed with the FDEP permit, and we'll bring that permit to the uh, governor's cabinet, and, and whether they approve, assuming they approve that permit. We'll bring that, this back to that board, and that it'll all be approved at that time for that uh, use of that marina. So I guess not to get too much into the weeds, um, I'm obviously not an attorney, but um, if the DO that's existing and has been subject to several extensions specifically excluded a marina, how can you go forward with permits through the DEP to come back to us when We've already gotten, by your account, you've got extensions on it that don't include a marina. That would call for a change or an amendment to the existing DO, which I believe, I'm not sure if that can be done under the exceptions and exemptions that it has been granted through extensions. I understand. I'm going to let Mr. Harrison answer this. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is William Harrison, 101 Harrison Avenue, over in Panama City. Uh, Councilman, the, there, there are two different processes. One is for the upland development, which the DO was issued in 2009. There is a separate process under Chapter 11 for marina siting. At the time that the upland project was approved, it was specifically stated by the city at that time that there were two separate processes. It's just that the marina talks about exactly the situation we have here, uh, where there is a, uh, a certificate of occupancy issued for the upland uh, uh, development and a CO that is issued for the marina itself. And then if there are two separate applications and two separate um, owners, then Chapter 11 provides for how those are married up uh, and brought into a single owner at the end of that process. Okay, and I don't want to belabor this, but I, I, I'm just, I, I don't understand because all this would hinge on you or whoever attorney coming back to this council and the council agreeing or the staff agreeing to allow in a marina on a project that has been extended now for nine years and specifically excluded the marina. So it's just, it, it bothers me that it feels like we're going out of order here and that you should have come to the city and the council and gotten the marina or asked us for a marina and then gone through the steps for a, a, a permit for a, a marina. Yes, ma'am. I understand the confusion, but that is what your code uh, requires, uh, two separate processes. Um, and, and there's a difference in a marina being excluded that's because there was a separate process versus the marina being prohibited. Uh, if you look at the 2009 development order that was approved and the construction drawings uh, that are on the city's website, 
it shows the location of the marina and as you pointed out you know the name of the the project uh, includes that it is a yacht club so um, all of that has been contemplated from the very beginning uh, it is the city that instructed uh, the original owners that there were two separate processes and that's what the code outlines in chapter 11. If I could just interject for just a minute um, because we have discussed this issue with the applicant prior to tonight and um, the city's position was that if they wanted to come forward with this um, presentation they could certainly do so but the city um, would require a major deviation to the DO. Now the applicant and staff haven't um, come to an agreement on that but the prior city manager and prior community development director have determined that process would be required. So um, if the attorney wants us to look at this other process, um, you know, we can do that, but we're not prepared to agree with that statement tonight. Thanks. Um, so I have another question then, um, because I, I note that there was an original permit application done with the DEP back in 2010, and their findings at that time had some additional benefits that were required and um, I'm just wondering why the difference because I know uh, Mr. Trammell spoke about the NPEB they're showing that the MPPB actually was a requirement of 1.8 million dollars in benefits and two of those suggestions were um, y'all building the bathrooms at Noriega Point and then y'all extending the driveway and adding parking along the route. So can you elaborate on that and where that went and why that might not be effective this time around? Absolutely. Um, there was actually a half a dozen iterations and, and various alternatives that were proposed and some of which had gone all the way up to the governor's board. Um, one, at one point in time, was a half a million or a million dollars directly to Heritage Park. Um, long story short, the reason that the major difference between the dollar amount in 2005 versus the dollar amount today, simply the valuation of the marina. The marina value was so much higher from the 2005 appraisal versus the appraisal that we just had performed this year, that's where your main difference comes from. And we did ask the, the state should we write a check to go toward, you know, the city has numerous parks, we could always throw in more amenities. The city did not want to consider that uh, such a, or excuse me, the state. The state did not want to consider such a proposal. Thank you for answering my questions. Mr. Marler. In reference to what Mr. Dixon was talking about, was where we, the emergency dock, is it possible because we have a shortage of pump out stations for the boats that we already have here. I believe Harbor Walk is the only one that's actually running. Uh, would it be possible as a public benefit? I know Mr. Destin asked the question, and you would be hauling it off, but possibly the public benefit could be a uh, pump out for the public use somewhere at, at the end of the dock or somewhere nearby, like it, where, the, where the, we're going to put the emergency dock, if that was the case? I, I, very, I like very much where you're going. The difficulty is the infrastructure that's out there now. We can't simply make a connection to the existing sewer. We have to contain that sewage and then haul it off. If it is a public facility at the mouth of the harbor, I can see it being heavily utilized. Um, it would really be a decision for the city as to whether or not they'd like to place that infrastructure on Noriego Point. Um, there's not a lot of room in that right-of-way. There's not a lot of room in the upland, uh, upland parcel. Um, it, would, it would just be very difficult. There may be better locations. Okay, but it's not impossible. So no, and, and we, could always, we could always put the infrastructure in. Let's say we're a year or two from now. We have the dock. The city can apply for, there's a number of grants um, for installing pump-out facilities, and you could come out and install those on the existing dock yourself. Okay, all right. I got a couple questions. <clears throat> what you're asking here is a vote to receive either a public benefit or a check to the city, or we don't vote to, uh, uh, to accept any money from y'all and it goes straight to the state, or is it just a public benefit? And if a check is written, it just goes to the state and then go spend it in June down there in Southwest Florida where they're having algae problems. It goes to the state 
and then the, the discretion of how they spend it is on the state. So um, you're correct. We, the first option is to cut a check that does not go to the city, that goes to the state. It's controlled by the governor's board and cabinet. The second option is the proposed public benefit items that we've outlined here tonight. So if we don't, uh, if this council decides not to receive this proposed public benefit, you're still going to write a check to the state to continue your permitting process. I don't want to speak on behalf of the applicant. Yes. So we either get a, we either get six hundred thousand dollars worth of something, or y'all are going to just write a check to the state. We don't get anything, and you're going to continue on the process. I just want to make that clear. But don't they? But would you still get the twenty-five foot setback? Issue. Yeah, we we haven't gone into that far down the rabbit hole. Um, but yes, Mayor, you're, you're correct. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the public benefit items that we've proposed, which we have vetted with the state. They felt if we got the support of the local government, we, we could go all the way to the governor's board and cabinet. Again, it's his decision and that board's decision at that time. Um, but we felt we had a very good chance, as do, as do the, the state staffers. Um, option B is the check. Do you like to answer that, Mr. Winkler? No, I'm, just, I'm just here to just clarify that, what, what she said and what, what Matt, how Matt answered. Okay, so I just want to make that clear. Um, and this is not, for, you're not asking us to approve the building of the marina or anything no. like that. This is strictly whether we want to get a public benefit worth $580,000 and plus some change or not. It's, uh, I think it's a total of 660000 um, uh, total debt uh, benefit plus uh, we're asking for the 25 foot uh, setback waiver and and so if we receive this public benefit you still have to come back before this council yes, to well, ask permission next. to build a marina or to build a condominium that's a whole separate issue than what we're talking about tonight yes we're, we will no matter what we have to complete our FDEP permit we have to complete our core permit we have to go to the governor's cabinet and then only after that, I believe, we have to go to the Harbor Harbor Board and then City Council. Then back to you all, the City Council, for the actual marina. Okay, I just, and I'm asking that question not only for my own edification, but just so we all understand, and the public for that matter, where we're at in this stage. What you're asking for and what we're trying to decide whether we want to go this route or not. And I see that my questions actually activated a few more people that would like to talk further. So I'll be quiet and we'll let our council people step up to the plate. Yes, we will. Um, let's go ahead, uh, Mr. Oberdeer. Okay, so one of the things I guess that we, that we asked about was the 25 foot wet setback. But in the recommended motion, it, it um, asked for us to approve the 25 foot setback. So I mean, we could, we could, we could. If, if we, I mean, I guess we could make a motion and not approve the 25-foot setback, and still approve the public benefit. So, so the motion is the 25-foot setback and the the proposed public benefit. And the reasoning for this is it is a very long and convoluted process with the permitting. We cannot go to the harbor board without our full, complete DEP and core permit. We cannot get our DEP permit until we get the public benefit approved by the governor's board and cabinet. We can't finalize the marina and the proposed benefit until we get some, some buy-in from the local government tonight. So um, we should have made a flow chart. I, I apologize. But. Okay, and the only reason I bring that up, I mean, I'm not against the 25-foot setback, but I think maybe some people are. It's the only thing. And so just so everybody knows that if, we, if we're going to vote on this, that's, that may be what we're voting on. So I don't know if anybody else wants to ask some more about the 25-foot setback. All the items are in one, uh, I did, uh, in one agenda item. The one vote is the way my understanding is. All right, honest. Mr. Morgan. Thank you. So we can vote no, you all go forward, and you build the marina, but without the 25-foot setback. Am I right? Um, actually, if you vote no tonight, they can still go forward. Sure. Lower the scale of it. They still have to come back before you to get approval for the marina, no matter what. At a public hearing. What, what is, uh, how much, if, if we deny the 25 foot setback, we're obviously waiving the right to the public benefit, right? Oh, to, to, 
Uh, well, I was, I was just going to clarify, if, if the vote goes no on both items tonight, what I envisioned would happening is we remove that northernmost slip and then we proceed on with the permit as we, as we normally. So instead of being a 50 slip cool. marina, we're a 49. Okay. Cool. Um, that's. So, um, we, okay. we Thank would you. go back to the state. And, and I know you called it a rescue dock, but one of the things outside of the people that own boats that can pull up to Norego Point and hop across the boardwalk that's not done yet to get to the other side, I would envision that water taxis and private boat owners who so choose could tie up to that rescue dock or whatever it's called to access the uh, well that that would have, that would be, would be public this, access no or would that be that, up to the city that would be strictly up to the city and one of one of the things if, if i may um i spoke to uh, mr dixon and some other uh, people in the life safety in the fire departments if if if, if we took that eighty thousand dollars and isolated it for life safety issues within the city limits of Destin. So the money stays here. Um, it, you know, from some of uh, Mr. Dixon's comments and some other comments I've heard through, through uh, people in the community, we would be okay with that as long as it was de be dedicated to life safety. But it's the states. But it's but ultimately hold on hold on ultimately it's up to the governor and the cabinet that it would be our. That that answered that. Um, Chatham, is that it? You good? Okay. Uh, Nick, uh, Mr. Oberdeer, your second go. Okay, Mr. Dixon. Um, I won't belabor the rescue dock. There's just no way I could support that. It sounds like tonight, tonight that we're basically being told that that either you approve this or you're going to lose this six hundred thousand dollars, and the 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 fact is is that really we haven't had a chance to look and see what we would want to see the public benefit be you've described what benefit that you would want us to have and and it should be up to us to describe or to 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 choose what benefit we would want to have if we choose to have a benefit but the 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 fact that we've got you know, you here tonight basically saying, take it or leave it, or we're going to send, and I'm not saying you're saying it like that. Please don't take it wrong. But basically, if you don't accept this, what we're going to do is we're going to send a check to the state. The state ultimately is probably going to bring the money back and do something here anyway with it. And the, the, the fact that if the project didn't exactly like it should be, I don't think that holding out five or six hundred thousand dollars should be where we make our decision you know I mean I don't care what it what it's on but it's kind of like the same premise of whether or not you want to let somebody build some kind of monstrosity building and then using the example of well you know you're gonna lose out on that tax base if you don't let us build it it's the same kind of thing and, and so you know in my opinion we we didn't really get the opportunity to, to say what public benefit we'd like to see. We got told what public benefit you would like to see. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, I personally couldn't support this tonight. Um, but, but I would like to look at the benefit that we all could maybe agree on and, and, and go from there. But yeah, I understand if you want to take it from tonight and you want to send that check to the state, I get it. But I'd rather it go that way then I had to to make it to where we are are basically up here trying to dis choose which side of the everything we'd like to see. In other words, the, the worst uh, case scenario, we're, we're choosing the best of everything worst. And, and so the, the problem that, that I have with it is that we really don't have an option here. It's either take it or leave it kind of thing. And to be honest with you, I'm ready to leave it right now. So, yeah. If, if I may address that, um, that is not the case. We are not here to strong arm the city. We're not here to, you know, give you this is the take it or leave it option. Where we are is we've been in the permitting process for DEP for over a year. Um, we've asked for our permit to be extended three times. Um, we were here originally for a city council two months ago. We are at the point in, in time in the permitting process that if we don't do something, the state can very well deny our authorization. 
That's number one. That's, that's a big concern for a business. Number two, we didn't come here with a half-baked idea. Um, the state has the ultimate authority. Some of the biggest concerns of the state are free and open water access and water quality. That dredging hits on both of those about the best, the best idea that we could come up with. We vetted a number of ideas with the state who is going to approve this with the applicant, what they're willing to propose, uh, myself being a lifetime resident of Destin. Um, we looked at a lot of alternatives. If you have any other options, Mr. Marler recommended a sewage pump out. We, uh, we recommended to the state, well, let's roll in more money into the Noriego Point project. Um, let's roll in more money to the, uh, the Heritage Park project. They weren't keen on those. They weren't keen on those ideas. They want to see something implemented in a very short order fashion um, and something directly related to this project and in the local water body. Otherwise, they're happy to, to take the money elsewhere. Um, so we really have put a lot of thought into this proposal and I'd love to hear your ideas. If, if you have any other ideas, I can't guarantee them because we're under the gun. Um, and and I, I, I literally, our response is due to the state the 22nd um, of this month, two days. So, and we've already asked for extensions. We've, we've pushed them as much as we can, and now it's to the point to where, well, just, just give us 30 more days to work on that public benefit. We promise we're going to make it better this time. Um, we all know it's a difficult time right now in the city, but we've, it, it's tough for us too. I'm glad you brought that up, because I was going to ask about a timeline. Because, that's it. You know, I, you know, I think, I think, Mr. Dix, and I'm not going to speak for him. I think his choice of words maybe was that we were, you're trying to ram it down our throats. That I, no, I understand not that you're not. We live here. I never this, said that. <clears throat> no. <laughs> and, I, and I don't. Not, I not ram it down the throats, but uh, dictate. I think was the word you use. Okay, uh, Mr. Obadier. Okay, and I mean, I mean, I, I'm going to just expand a little bit on, on what Tuffy said. Um, the whole, the whole, the part, part of this is, is that I've heard too much conversation already tonight that a lot of folks are not in favor of some of these public benefits, and they think that there might be some other places where we could get better public benefit. And, and I, I understand what you're saying, that the, this is basically what the state told you to give us. And, 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 and that, really, that, that right there, I just came back from a, a, a Preble and I were at a conference this weekend, talked about what we call home rule. And home rule says that the people here in Destin know what people in Destin need, not the people in Tallahassee. So. I, I realize the governor's board and I respect them and, and all they do, but for them to tell us what we need as public benefit may be not the way we want to go down this. So I would rather, and I, I know you're on a short timeline here, and I know you, now you're saying you only got two days. Well, we can't get it done probably in two days, but you know, if you tell them that you just came to us and, and told us this, and we want just a little bit of time to work on this, and I think we could have a, a, a workshop or whatever we have to have, um, so we can come up with our own ideas of what we want to have for public benefit. Maybe, maybe we want to buy another, a new harbor pump. I, know, I mean, I know we need that, and that, that helps water quality. So all I'm asking is, or all I would say is, I mean, I'd vote no on tonight and ask that we just allow us to, to come back to you and tell you what we think would be the, the public benefit that we want. Go ahead. Do you want to respond to that? No, go okay. I'll, 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 just one point, Mr. Overdyer. Um, the access is one of the key issues. So it's not just this is a great environmental restoration project or this is a great project that the public can get behind. It has to be directly related to waterway access, um, probably more so than water quality, I hate to say. Um, this was one that hit on all cylinders. You know, again, we really put a lot of thought into, uh, into this proposal. So, Thank you. Um, this will be the last go around on comments, and then I'll just entertain a motion. We'll, 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 and, and before we take a motion, we'll have public comment real quick before anyone makes a motion. So I've got three people in line. I'll let them make their comments. Then we'll open this up to public uh, comment, and then we'll entertain a motion in a second, and then we'll go ahead and bring this to a vote. So, Ms. Ramswell. Thank you. Um, I just keep coming back to the fact that this is a public benefit for a marina that's not in the existing DO. So we're talking about something that hasn't even come to us to approve yet. 
it's putting the chicken before the egg or egg before whatever that expression is y'all come up with your own but to me it just it doesn't make sense to approve something when it's not even in the do that we have and then the, to further complicate matters i'm not even sure if an amendment to allow a marina is something that would be allowable this from what i understand is part of a, of a lawsuit that happened plus it's also part of multiple extensions i mean i don't know if that's something you can address or not but doesn't changing a, a, a do in this situation invalidate some of the conditions that were initially in place and the conditions of the extensions that were granted yes. but again i come back to the fact that what, There's what, no what, marina what on the it? DO, and we're talking about a public. And, okay, I've said it. Please <laughs> help. So, if if any of the conditions of the DO are changed, a major deviation would be required, which is one of the reasons that we've told the applicant that a major deviation would be required. That's under the definition of a major de deviation in the code. So, since the marina was specifically excluded, that's been staff's position. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of things. I, I disagree about there being a major deviation, and, and I've talked with Ms. Kopp about that, and we agree to disagree on that. Um, there's a difference in the marina being uh, excluded versus it being prohibited. It is not prohibited. Chapter 11 provides for that. It is a separate process. When the DO was approved, the city council at that time uh, advised the the property owner that there were two separate processes one for the upland and one for the marina and chapter 11 spells that out uh, concerning the litigation there was litigation between holly isle and the property owner at that time in 2004 concerning the development order that was issued by the city there was a settlement agreement and in the settlement agreement between Holiday Isle and the owner, there were a lot of provisions that were included in there. And I don't know if you've, if you've read them or if you're familiar uh, with that. But basically what it says, in 2004, there will be an upland condominium project and there will be a marina. And Holiday Isle will not object to the uh, condominium project and they will not object to the marina. In fact, it says that they will support both of those. If there are minor deviations, then those uh, don't have to go to Holiday Isle for their review. Uh, if there are major deviations, then only what is a deviation goes to Holiday Isle for their review. But nothing else is subject to the review and comment of Holiday Isle. The agreement uh, that is executed by Holiday Isle and by the, the previous owner says that all of the responsibilities uh, included in that uh, settlement agreement inure to the benefit or to the detriment of those parties. So every, you know, the board of directors at Holiday Isles and, and under contract and, and under covenant and restriction that they have for all the owners in that project who give authorization and delegate authorization to the board of directors. And I don't know whether there was a, a neighborhood vote or if this was a board of directors, but regardless, every property owner has delegated their, their vote, if you will, to the board of directors who voted and who executed the settlement agreement that said that there will be a marina and there will be a condominium and they will support it. So that's where we sit today. And, and in response to that, because of that settlement agreement, there were monies paid by the applicant at that time to Hot Isle. Uh, I think there was $45,000 towards attorney's fees. There were past due homeowners association fees that were paid of $3,400. And there was $100,000 paid uh, to Hot Isle for them to do whatever they wanted to with the $100,000, whether it's sidewalks or lighting or whatever they wanted to do. Additionally, there was the 100-foot right-of-way that was transferred from that property owner uh, to the city for the benefit of Holiday Isle and for the city, and that roadway is there. And so everybody has gotten the goody out of this whole thing, 
I mean, that settlement, the city got what they wanted, Holiday Isle got what they wanted, and now it's time for the property owner to come back and say, okay, remember the settlement agreement? Remember the development order that was approved? Remember everything that we went through in litigation and in the development process for approval of this project? As you noted, the, the uh, uh, condominium and yacht club now we're back, according to Chapter 11 of the Land Development Code, for marina siting, and that's the process that we're, that we're following. So I'm sorry that there's some confusion about that. Probably none of us were there when all this was drafted, but all we can do is follow the process that's in the code. So we're doing that. We're following the settlement agreement. We're following the state statute, and as far as the, the net uh, positive environmental benefit, we're trying to guess as best we can with the educated experts that we have what will be acceptable to the state. There's been a lot of engineering and a lot of cost to go into that. And we can probably sit here and negotiate some other things, but ultimately if it's not approved by the governor and the cabinet, whenever it goes there, then we're going to come back here, all of us starting over. And that would be... Um, unfortunate for the city and for the applicant to lose control over that and have the governor and the cabinet to decide who has the authority according to the the 1974 minutes they're the ones that established this we can talk about a lot of different things myself i believe that ultimately they're going to do something in the harbor that you know the, as far as the life safety doc we may all sit here and agree let's put it somewhere else you know there may be a, a, a better place but ultimately, what the governor and the cabinet is trying to do in the 1974 minutes of that meeting is to improve the water quality of the harbor. And, and so I think that's what they'll circle back to, and I think that's what they'll, they'll vote on eventually. So we're trying our best to do something that will be agreeable that we think is beneficial uh, to the city and everybody that uses the harbor. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you done? Don't, the issues I have with it is, I mean, from what we've heard and, and seen in the presentation tonight and, and things we've heard from the, the council, um, it's a lot to, lot to swallow, a lot to digest. Um, and it could be something that affects the city for possibly the next 200 years. Um, and it, it's tough for me to, you know, take that all in and make a, a decision on it, you know, in, in an hour's time. Um, you know, with the it being brought up that the marina wasn't in the the, the DO or whatever, I don't know if this is a, just a backdoor way of getting the marina. It may or may not be. I don't know. That's why I would like to have more time to do my own homework and do some research and um, to just get more educated on it. Um, and if you could, um, I'd also like you know to to do more research and get educated on it. I'd like if you would. Uh, be so inclined to provide uh, the staff, uh, saying get it to the council, um, your documentation where you say that Holiday Owl supports this, um, so we can see that. Um, like I said, it's just, uh, I know you get frustrated, um, you know, because you talk about all the benefits and everything that's already there and the roadway, you mentioned roadway was there, um, but the roadway is not there. We got, yeah, we may have the right of way, but there's, you can't drive on it. It's, um, but anyhow, um, if you could, you get that to the staff so we could, you know, could see it. Um, and that's, um, like I say, it's just a lot, to, a lot to take in, you know, in an hour's time and make a decision on it that, like I say, that's, that's going to affect the city from here on in. Yes, sir. The, the documents that uh, you're talking about uh, are in the, the backup material for the agenda item. They were in the backup uh, material for the agenda item in May. Uh, and so uh, it, it's been in the hands of the, the staff and the council for, uh, for four months now. Yes, sir. I've, I've, I've uh, have been through it, and I've, I've yet to see anything that said that they supported it. I know all the, everything that you're talking about, the, the last lawsuit and, that you had with the Holiday Owl Group, and I know all about that, but I just haven't seen... I'll be happy to give you a copy of it, or I can read it. Uh, if... Now, it, it's in the material. 
and um, it's clear the whole settlement agreement's in, in the briefing material. Just, just for a point of clarification, the settlement agreement is between the association and uh, the city was not a party to the agreement. So just for your reference, the city did not sign off on the agreement. This was a lawsuit between two private parties. And it's in the briefing document. Okay, we're going to have, uh, at this point, um, I have nobody in line. We've all had our chat. So let's open this up to public comment. And I've got two people that specifically want to talk on this, and I'll ask for them to come up first. Uh, you have three minutes to make your comments. And then uh, I'll look you out there in the audience, and if anyone else would like to step up and make a comment, um, we'll do it at that time. And, and after we hear your public comments, I'll entertain a motion on this um, uh, uh, presentation, uh, and then we'll just see where it goes on the Point Resort docking facility. Uh, first up will be uh, Stephen Mitchell. Quick caveat before I start. Some of this has been addressed. Name. Some of it, I Name. will. I'm Name. Steve Menchel, 65 Siesta Bluff. I'm just going to go ahead and read what I already prepared. I realize some of it's going to be redundant, but it, for, to speed things along. Um, the stated public benefit of this approximately $640,000 is misleading and, in fact, favors the applicant more than the public. And none of the Noriega planning workshops has there been any mention that the need for a dock facility. In fact, it's believed that such a facility would be a detriment to the interest and pur pur purpose of boat landing. There likely would be arguments, actually you discussed this, on who would use it and possibilities of swimming and, and diving hazards. The park would be better off not having a docking facility. The current boat beaching arrangement has served the public well for decades. A dock is not needed, nor is it wanted. It is widely believed that such a dock would benefit the applicant more than the public. It's clearly understandable that approximately one acre adjacent to the bulkhead needs and requires dredging. However, the dredge work suggested as a public benefit to the Destin Harbor Navigational Channel is not needed. This, again, appears to, again, benefit the applicant more than the public, and it also provides a deep water approach to the marina and provides a cheap source of sand for the Point Resort project. There is no plan by the federal government to my understanding to change or relocate the buoy line. Alternate public benefits for your consideration would be provide funding to rebuild and upgrade the harbor flushing pump and add much-needed instrumentation and maintenance items, provide money to build additional sewage pump out stations at key points in the harbor, and provide money to build water treatment to stormwater runoff in the harbor. The application for the marina was recently changed from a commercial marina to a residential marina. Again, you covered some of this. There's a major issue in the DO for the plan upland, clearly states that a docking facility or marina is not included. Parking is a critical item for any marina. It's clearly not a consideration in the project. Any parking allocated to the marina or shared parking with the DO must be defined before the project should go forward. Furthermore, if the marina is part of a planned condominium, a new DO is required. And in all major projects, the most intensive has to be built first. Finally, the project was considered several years ago and stalled for many issues. But one of the major issues was safety, repeat safety. Certainly not the only one, but one of the major. It's a greater safety issue now with all the livery vessels, rentals, and also with the major new park amenity that will open next year. A professional state-approved safety study and release must be done before the project advances. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Next up, Danny Tigner. My name is Danny Tigner. I reside at 13 Noriega, Destin. The first presentation seemed to me to be somewhat unclear about the use of the dredge sand. The 40,000 cubic yards of dredge sand has a value of $1.4 million. $1.4 million for 40,000 cubic yards. That's based on $35 a cubic yard for sand that is truck delivered to Holiday Isle. Okay, so please keep that $1.4 million for 40,000 cubic yards in your mind. And they're only paying $580,000 to dredge it. Okay, <clears throat> to raise the 3.9 acre site from the current six feet elevation above sea level to the 14 feet that's gonna be required for them to, uh, to start construction of the building 
they are going to need over 50,000 cubic yards of sand. So it seems to me that it's very likely they're going to end up wanting to use that 40,000 cubic yards of sand worth $1.4 million and not give it to the city. So my point is, if you move forward, please keep that in mind and don't let that happen. Thank you, Mr. Tigner. Okay, ask uh, Mr. Can, can the sand from the harbor be put anywhere on the beach? And from, uh, that's in, a simple question. Involved in the, in the proposal, we were going to test. I haven't tested the material, so I can't answer. I can say that the material we dredged in the harbor for Noriego Point was deemed beach quality, and that material can go on to the, to the, to the beaches. And if I may address the previous gentleman's comment, we are not proposing to utilize any of that 40,000 cubic yards. Again, it's the city's permit to dredge the material. It's the city's decision to do with that material what you see fit. If you want to sell it, if you want to put it on the beaches, if it's suitable, that's your decision. We are dredging 10,000 yards from the bulkhead. That's more than enough than is needed for the DO for my discussion with the civil engineer. All right, thank you. I just, that question, I just wanted to make sure and see whether that was possible. I thought it'd be too dirty to put out there. I, I do not believe so from my background knowledge, and we did test it years ago, but um, the one thing I do agree with the gentleman is that sand is extremely valuable. All right, next up, Marcy Bell. Marcy Bell, 3 Gulf Breeze Court. So I don't come with a prepared statement. I take notes as you guys have your conversation. So a couple of things came to my mind while y'all were speaking. Uh, first of all, I'm a little confused on why um, we all keep talking about the governor and his cabinet and the DEP, but nobody's mentioned conversations with Holiday Isle, Okaloosa County, or even the Corps of Engineers. I mean, I would think that those three entities, government entities, would have something to say, or Holiday Isles on a government entity. Um, it's my understanding, as being a homeowner on uh, Holiday Isle, that I was never required to support um, an agreement for the marina and such. Uh, the navigational channel, doesn't that take an act of Congress to move that? I understand what you said, but just some thoughts on my part. Um, doesn't the county govern the waters of the Destin Harbor? They govern Crab Island. Um, let's see. If this project, which was originally a commercial with the DEP marina, if it was to ever go back to that, I want to remind the city that your zoning for that property is HDR, uh, which does not allow commercial activity uh, in that zone, and the Holiday Isle uh, PCNRs also do not allow commercial activity. Uh, the sand that they dredge cannot leave Holiday Isle, and I've spent a lot of time studying those um, extensions on those uh, on that development order, and they always refer to development order number 09-17. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bell. Any further comments from the audience? Well, we're going to go ahead and get a motion here and take a vote. And after that takes place, we're going to take a five-minute break. Is that okay, Tuffy? <laughs> I heard a sigh of relief. All right. Well, I'll, at, at this present time, um, the only comments I got to make is this is a uh, vote on the 25-foot uh, setback and whether we want to receive the public benefit proposed by the folks here basically in the night motion. so um just entertaining a motion al along those lines so that, do i mr mayor i'll vote to I'll, I'll make a motion to deny this tonight i'll second okay we got a motion to deny and we got a second any further comment i think we've commented ourselves to death everybody good we're gonna go ahead and take this to a vote We, if the vote is five to two, ayes have it, so moved. We're going to take a five-minute break. See you on court.
Can we have everybody uh, make their way back to their seats? All right, thank you. We're going to go ahead and call this meeting back to order. We got a, um, a couple of things that uh, next up is 2C, but we have um, um, uh, Jeff, you want to address our agenda? Yeah, I meant to bring this up during the agenda approval process. The uh, city manager has requested that, uh, the, that me and Kim Kopp, uh, we look into item number 4B and we meet with the labor attorney and vet the veracity and the accuracy of that report and then come back at a later point in time and kind of present that at the same time this report is presented. And he would like uh, the opportunity to do that before it gets presented. And uh, so we would like the request that 4B is pulled tonight. And also, um, after conferring with this cop, the number uh, 5C, the safety zone ordinance, uh, has some issues with it where Right now, it uh, has some enforceability issues the way it's drafted. So we'd like to kind of go back and take a fresh stab at it. Uh, I didn't have anything, at, and really, Ms. Cobb didn't have any hand in the initial drafting of it either. So uh, we'd like a chance to maybe t take a stab at uh, drafting something that's a little more legally enforceable. Okay, um, and how we'll approach this is we'll do each one individually. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to have a change of order. Um, Mr. Dessen? Mayor, I'll, I'll make a motion to set aside the order of the day and uh, table 4B. Second. Okay, and we need a majority uh, vote here. So uh, we have a motion to uh, have a change of order of the day. Is table the right word to use, Mr. Burns, or should we? Continue? Actually, set aside the order of the day first. We're just going to set aside the order of the day. And then you can understand. All right, so let's have a vote. Set aside the order of the day. Okay, it's a 6-1, uh, uh, so moved. And I think on that particular um, uh, issue, we're going to give Mr. Johnson an opportunity to review it himself and formulate his opinion. Uh, the report that Ms. Lejeune gave um, addressing the, the conversation is on the public record. The public can uh, view her assessment uh, to these items online. So it's in the public record, and then we're just going to uh, offer our staff, um, uh, HR and Mr. Johnson, an opportunity to um, review it for themselves, seeing how they're in responsible positions. Next. So we, we need a motion to I'm gonna remove it. To to uh, basically the effect mayor to allow uh, the city manager and the attorneys to review it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go 4B. ahead and make uh, make the motion for 4B to be tabled and instruct um, uh, HR director, um, city manager and the attorneys to review. We have a motion. We have a second. If there's no further discussion, we'll go ahead and vote. Sorry, Ms. Ramswell, I had already hit the voting button, but hold up on the votes, guys. Can you delete that, Ray? <coughs> Go ahead, Ms. Ramswell. Thanks. I just wanted to state for the record, and in case you'll need it, I have countered every single point that was made as a rebuttal with um, additional evidence and supporting documentation, if that's necessary. Just share that with the city manager and the staff, not up here. Sure. All right, we got a motion. We have a second. Let's go to vote on tabling this or instructing the um, uh, Lance to review this. It's unanimous, so moved. And Item 5C, Mayor, the, the ordinance, the safety portal ordinance. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, we have a lot of people here that wanted to comment on that, and, and, and so. Um, do we really do we want to go ahead and just change that or would we rather hear from the folks 
and th and then and then move forward from there. Or would you rather we just go ahead and give you more time? Um, would you like to speak on that, Kim? Sure. Um, in light of the erosion control line and the movability and the enforceability issues with the ordinance, I would recommend that staff have a little more time, possibly meet with the first responders and the sheriff's office to try to come up with some alternate ideas and then bring it back. Mr. Dixon? I hate for people that have came to the meeting tonight that have basically sat here for two and a half hours to discuss this issue possibly. I don't know that the people are here to, to discuss this, but I hate for them not to be able to tell us their feelings on this if it's on the agenda. But well, I don't want to create a problem by allowing people to come up and speak on something we haven't addressed yet. So I don't know where we are with that. I really hate the fact that we didn't pull this sooner and the reason that we didn't pull it sooner and they could have left if they didn't want to stay here for this and everything. Well, well the good news is they can still make their comments under item three and in, 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 uh, on that particular issue we're just not going to under this proposal by the the attorneys we're just not going to act on it it doesn't mean that these people can't share with us now their feelings on that particular issue which will further prepare us and the, the attorneys as they move forward on maybe we'll hear from, from our community where they stand on that. So if it, if it pleases the council, I think we'll, Mr. Just, we'll go ahead and move on this particular. Mr. Mayor, let me, can, can I just say one more thing and I'll be done with this, okay? I promise is that it says on here that if we're going to bring, let them bring it up under public comments that all agenda items on this other than, other than under number five. So, I mean, you, we would have to, I think, set aside the order of the day, whatever it is that I know, but basically. Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to set aside the order of the day. I'd like to have the public who has come here tonight be able to speak. Um, that does not mean that I wouldn't be in favor of tabling it afterwards for a re a legal, re legal review for enforcement purposes, but uh, this is a miserable process if you came here for two and a half hours to sit and you didn't even get to say your piece. So that's all that's all I want. That's my my opinion, that's my motion. I want I'll to second. This. Okay. So, we're setting aside so we can open it up for 4 uh, I'm sorry, for 5C. Can I point out that we've skipped item 2C? 2C is going to come after. I didn't put a scratchy mark in, so we were good. All right, Mr. Braden, do you want to make a comment? Or no, I just want to make sure they had a chance to speak. Okay. So. Mayor, yeah. real quick, and, and just for the public, I'm, I'm going to uh, pass on under my name where I address speech issues and code enforcement tonight. We're going to get to it too late, and, um, and, and I'll pick it up at a shorter meeting, probably the meeting where the safety zone corridors on here. Thanks. So noted. So the beach guys can leave. All right. Well, we got a, a motion to change the order of the day again, and we have a second. So let's go ahead and vote on to change the order of the day. Unanimous. So moved. All right. So. We're actually going to take this issue up. First reading of Ordinance 18-17-LC Safety Zone Regulation. And I'm going to open it up for public hearing at this time. And, uh, Mayor, typically we, we would read it, but I think you've heard the recommendations of the two attorneys is to table it and kill it. So uh, I'll dispense with reading it, if, if you don't mind. So. That's fine with me. All right. I have a couple people. Uh, tr well, I think these are for the general comment period. Raise your hand if you want to speak on the beach safety corridor, sir. Come on up. Thank everyone. We'll give everybody a chance to speak. Steve Hill, um, 522 Noriega. Um, I own Holiday Owl Beach Service. I talked to you last week. I couldn't remember one thing, and the one thing that I couldn't remember was how are you going to enforce this? For one thing, just like I explained to you before, you're taking the 20 feet 
that everybody in the world wants to use, and the city of Destin is going to say, we got a great idea, you can't use it. And then, are you going to get out there at 6 in the morning and drive down and tell everybody that you can't? Because I get out there at 6, and there's already people set up in front of this stuff. Anyway, so you're going to go within, and then you're going to turn around, and you're going to come back and tell them again. And as soon as they see you drive away, in other words, you're going to have to hire a lot of people. And then all you're going to do is piss everybody off, which I think is kind of silly. But anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. Red shirt, I'm sorry. Just state your name and your address when you come up. My name is Alex Metz of 260 Sunrise Circle. Um, I represent Sunny Sands Beach Service. Uh, we have about four or five locations in Destin. Uh, I wanted to thank the city management staff at the time for pulling us all together in a room for the first time since the lifeguards were established and asking our opinion. Um, it was of the almost unanimous opinion of all the beach vendors, the lifeguards, and the sheriffs that we all supported the corridor, all, all except obviously one vendor. So um, it's very rare that we all get on almost one page and see eye to eye with the sheriffs and the lifeguards with all the same goal in mind. And um, we want to thank you for asking our opinion and hope we'll see you next time it's up on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Come on. I'll get you next. Thanks for allowing us to do this. This is very nice. Uh, my name is Jim Blaine. I'm from Springfield, Missouri. I'm a physician. Uh, I'm also the HOA uh, president uh, for the Capri. Um, I live in Springfield, Missouri. I've been coming here for 40 years. I own two condos at the Capri. Um, I've trained paramedics for 17 years. Um, and I think the, the salient <coughs> issue here, I think it's brilliant, is to open that corridor for uh, emergency access and not allow anyone to set up anything there than a beach blanket or a body of their own so that they can move. Uh, because those of us that have worked in trauma, as I have for decades, realize that there is the golden hour. And the golden hour is the time that you've got to save someone's life, typically, in a trauma situation, whether it be uh, a trauma that might occur in the water or a heart attack, uh, whatever. Um, and so uh, seconds are ticking. And trying to get down to someone, um, uh, I can't imagine what you might have to go through to do that, uh, currently having been on distant beaches all this time. so. Uh, I would be very much in favor of speaking as an emergency physician, speaking as a uh, parent and a uh, grandparent, and, uh, and I think for the, for the public safety. Thank you. Could I ask you a question? Yes, sir. You, because you have experience in this. Um, it's brought up that, that close to the water thing is really the golden 20 feet. Yes. Do you think maybe a uh, safety corridor along the dune line or, or, or back might be where people don't want to be might be the better place for a corridor like that? Yes, sir. I, I think multiple th reasons. Uh, when I uh, first took over this HOA presidency back about five years ago, I got about 300 emails. We've got a very nice beach vendor now that, that really facilitates. I don't think I've had a single call uh, since that time. So, so he really works with people to make them happy. Prior to that, we had a lot of people that were scrambling over that quarter that you're talking about. And I think it makes perfect sense not to allow any of us, private or public, to put our junk in there, our beach stuff uh, there that would impede the emergency vehicles, number one. And then number two, uh, I think that kind of brings us all together. Uh, I'm, I'm for sharing uh, the beach front there with everybody, but not having tents and things set up in front of other people. and, and and all of the acrimony that occurs uh, around there. I, I think uh, we need some consistency, uh, and let's, uh, let's make it a nice, safe corridor that we can all uh, enjoy and, and be safe for our families, and that we can lay out there and enjoy the beach and on our beach blankets together. But uh, private beach, you can put your stuff back, back on there. And so it, it makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for sir. your comments. Next. <laughs>
Ken Wampler, 310 Lower IP Loop. Thanks for allowing me to speak on this. Um, I think it's imperative that we do think about the enforcement. Um, I represent a lot of private property owners that have a deed all the way down to the waters line and to, to take some of their private beach, I think, is, is not what the county is talking about, and I, and I appreciate that. And as Alex said earlier, the city brought together the, the lifeguards and the beach vendors and came with a consensus, and the two corridors was discussed in length. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I think all of the beach service vendors and the lifeguards and the private property owners want to do what's best for everybody, which includes enforcement. This year, we've already had an example of uh, someone uh, trying to use private property and then the sheriff saying that we have to take it up with code enforcement. So enforcement of that is going to be critical because all the, all the parties were involved in coming up with an emergency corridor for the safety of all the public. And it also fixes the other complaint that you get from beachgoers that aren't staying beachfront is they feel like they can't walk up and down the beach, so it accomplishes that. So at the same time, I think you're going to solve a lot of problems, but enforcement of it so that when the private property owner has someone squatting on their property and they won't kindly leave and the sheriff has to be called that they have the authority to take any action if they're going to versus telling uh, the beach lifeguards or the beach service to call code enforcement which you know depending on time of day that's not a very effective way of enforcing that so it's a give and take if the private property owners are willing to give that up the return is enforce private property uh, owners rights and don't let people squat on their property when they've been asked nicely to leave uh, and we've had a horror story where one of the uh, beach vendors actually got accosted and you know, that's the kind of stuff that we don't want to happen on our beaches and s clearly the city of Destin doesn't want that as a reputation and, and trip advisor and all the vacation rental sites so thank you very much thank you very much Hi, I'm Kim Rouser. I live at 4618 Windstar Drive. I'm a new resident to Destin, and I've been here for 22 months. I am not opposed to the beach chair service. I am opposed to that there isn't any penalties or enforcement that um, I have personally witnessed and I have personally experienced at some point. There is one area I'm talking about, Pompano and Tarpon Street, and I have been physically brushed by this man's employees. I find it offensive. Um, I've watched them target people who come to our town, spend money here. I am just like they are. I work. I work for my tips. But I see them target people and ask them to move, ask them to get off equal parts of the beach. I just, I just find this just, we have to come to a, a situation here where if a beach chair service, you're getting a lot of complaints about them, then that person who owns that service should be penalized. Code enforcement needs to be involved. Um, and if they keep doing it and they keep her offending this, um, they're permanent then they should have their permits pulled. Thank you for their time. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else I would like to address the public or the council? Hi, I'm Steve Tejan, 4619 Windstar Drive, Destin. Um, thanks for listening for me today. Uh, family's been here 36 years. I've lived here for 22, um, live in the Crystal Beach area. Um, the biggest thing is I just wanted to know when did the, uh, back on June 26, 2002, the article stated that the uh, city law was um, 15 feet uh, north, uh, zone north of the uh, Tidal Debris line, and then uh, also the vendors to stay 20 feet away from the water's edge. So. That's what that states. I just was wondering when that would have changed. And the next thing was, is with that being in mind, if you did, did it that way, that would leave the 15 feet for people walking, whatever, and then another buffer 
for the emergency type thing. Or, like you said, something behind it might even be better. But still, you're leaving that front open for two possible ways. You could have the buffer in the back as long as you stated and left the front the same way of where it states in these that that's how the city's laws are. So that's why I was just wondering how that would change. And, you know, because even on the uh, application for a beach vendor, the application number eight even says where's the code enforcement for that. They say they can't even go. They have to stay back 20 feet, which if you read on that application, it's uh, number eight. So thank you for listening. Appreciate it, Steve. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to speak? Uh, Patrick Eimers, 123 Durango Road. Um, you guys mentioned earlier or questioned uh, where you prefer to ride up and down the beach. I think we need those two zones because the back zone is for emergency response. Obviously, there's a lot less traffic, so we have the people that are going to be walking in the front. Um, and then for patrolling, you obviously want to be sitting in the front. Um, it's all transient use. Um, I think we all, like Alex said, we kind of all agree on this. I worked with Preble at uh, Destin Beach Safety for about eight years. And so we, we know what it's like trying to look for a, a drowning patient when you're sitting behind a thousand umbrellas. So if we got everybody moved back, you can put the lifeguards up front and it makes it so much safer. Because it is about private property, it's also about safety for the public. So I just want to bring that up. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Because yeah. you're a pro. And you're an expert. If you had that safety corridor from the water's edge up 20 feet, that's where everybody wants to walk right. along the beach. It, so how do you address that? As, as if you're only patrolling that area, you're only going like five miles an hour. So people can kind of move around you. You're not actually emergency response. That's going to go on the back of the beach. When these, like the, uh, the sheriff's office responding to calls or lifeguards responding to calls, they're going to drive the back way. Um, but if they're just patrolling looking for, you know, you know, the kids drinking on the beach or where everybody's at, kind of walking around, um, that's where you patrol up front. And there's no room for that right now. So the sheriff's office and the lifeguards, they're sitting in the back and they can't see anything that's going on. So basically what you're explaining to me is that there'll be a designated safety quarter of 20 feet along the water's edge, but it's not like you keep people from walking up and down. It's just you can't set up and right. put stuff in right. there well, to prevent be you to... So basically, you know, your coolers, your toys, your blankets, your umbrellas, just keep it back. It'll be a lot easier. All right, thank you. All right. Any other comments? Seeing none... I don't think we we need another motion. We we pretty much just to kind of give you an idea. We're not trying to punt the whole idea. It's there. There's some serious issues in the way it's drafted. It would not ever been able to be enforced. It, it used to mean high water line as the, and people will confuse that with the erosion control line. They're not the same thing. I know the city. There was an article in the paper that had an engineer out there locating the erosion control line. They're different, and I don't know if they can also find the mean high water line, but that also changes every year. And uh, Walton County, I'm looking at theirs right now. They just passed theirs back in June, and they <laughs> sunk a lot of money into theirs, and so they probably betted it pretty heavily. Uh, they use a more of a subjective approach, uh, like distance from the toe of the dune, distance from the water's edge, which are subjective measures, not like the uh, erosion control line and mean high water line, which are going to be nightmares to ever enforce. Yeah, because like the ECL in some places right now on Holiday Isle are actually in the water because we've had such bad erosion. So hopefully we'll take care of that in October with the past dredging. All right, so. Mayor, I think I only set aside the order of the day and opened up and requested that you open up public comment. So I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to uh, table 5C and instruct uh, staff and the attorneys to take a look at it from an enforceability standpoint. Second. We got a, a motion, got a second? Second. Good. Okay, we, let's go ahead and ready for a vote. Anybody, any further discussion? Okay, we're going to go to a vote. So moved. <sighs> All right. Now on to item number three, which is public comment. Wait, we oh, got to get two C. Oh yeah. Sorry, Steve. Your turn. 
Come on up. We, we've set aside so much. I've lost my way, sir. Steve Menschel, Chairman of the Public Works and Safety Committee, here to give you a briefing on a Public Works and Public Safety Committee meeting from August the 14th. I'd like to first start off by thanking Interim City Manager Lance Johnson for taking the time to attend our meeting, and also Mr. John Mahone, Code Enforcement, for briefing the committee on the current code enforcement procedures and protocols. At the meeting, the committee made three motions, all of which were approved unanimously for your consideration and action. Due to current processes which take time for our minutes to be typed, approved, and then sent to council members for consideration and action, the committee asked that I brief you at this meeting. The first motion was based on a presentation made by Destin resident Mr. Stephen Durain, and I apologize, I'm probably screwing up the last name, regarding, quote, pedestrian traffic management solution, improving the pedestrian flow to and from the beaches for safety reasons within Crystal Beach. You don't have this as part of your packet because he'll, he'll be bringing this, but this gentleman did an outstanding job. He's got facts, he's got figures, and ultimately our suggestion is that you get him on your agenda. But at any rate, we voted unanimously in favor of this project and asked that this information be forwarded to the council and arrangements be made for Mr. Durant to present his proposal to you for your consideration. Very good product, and we wholeheartedly endorse it. The second motion, which was unanimously approved by the Public Works and Public Safety Commission, requested to be sent to the Council for consideration, is to add to the widening of Dolphin Street within the existing city right-of-way to the next five-year budget plan. Okay, so it's something we suggest that you go ahead. It's, Dolphin Street's been problematic for years, and we've been talking about it. It's not on the, on the radar screen for budget, so we suggest that you all put that in a five-year budget plan. Regarding the third motion, some background information. And you can put up any one of them. Okay, it's already up. Okay, regarding the third motion, some background information. If any of you have traveled on Scenic Highway 98 in Walton County this year, you may have noticed that each north-south pedestrian crosswalk, Walton County installed raised pavement markers, that's those little shiny things, or RPMs that are highly visible in daytime and nighttime conditions. The three photos in your agenda packet, which are one, page 151, 152, and 153, respectively, illustrate those RPMs in Walton County. The third motion made by the Public Works Public Safety Commission and unanimously approved was to provide the information to the Council for your immediate consideration and approval to install raised pavement markers along all of the pedestrian crosswalks along Scenic 98. As you know, several of our pedestrian crosswalks along Highway 98, Scenic, are dark and a committee feels for safety considerations these RPMs should be installed and request that you approve this as soon as possible. And finally, I contacted Walton County Public Works and obtained a description and part number for their RPMs that they used along Scenic 98 and I passed that information on to our staff. The RPMs, just for your information, cost approximately one to two dollars each. So at any rate, we are asking you to please consider this and approve it as soon as possible and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, the, for, for the safety aspect of what we could be getting for the small amount of money um, that this would cost, I'll go ahead and make the motion that we um, look into purchasing these um, raised median, uh, raised pavement markers, and from that point we get a price on how much they cost, and, and let's see about getting these things out. I'm, this is peanuts for what it could do, and I think it's a good idea, and I would make my motion to, to get these prices and to figure out how many of them that we need as fast as possible. Second. Okay, we've got a motion, we've got a second. Any further discussion? Thank you. What, what Steve, sit down, are we done? Okay, Steve. Thank you. So we've got a motion, we've got a second. Seeing no further discussion, go ahead and take this to a vote. Oh, uh, unanimous, so moved. And I did, of course, think of another question looking back at my notes. Um, the Dolphin Street widening, how wide is it now, and is it below standard width? And you don't have to tell me tonight just for you all to look into and bring that back, because if that is indeed a, a concern as the committee feels it is, I'd like us to look into that. 
I'll bring that back. Yeah, and is there enough access to widen it without buying property? Uh, that'll be another concern. Steve, may you, maybe you can answer some of that, seeing how y'all approved it unanimously, because I'm sure you, you looked at it. First of all, many of you weren't here. Major Brown, uh, he's a Special Forces operator. He came here a couple of years ago asking for assistance on Dolphin Street because it is so small. Um, I, I can't tell you the exact width right now, but it's the smallest north-south roadway in Destin, in Crystal Beach, okay? With all the large multi-hotel properties on there, parking's an issue. The key thing to your question, Mayor, is the fact that with the existing right-of-way, no property would have to be taken. It can be taken within the city's property. Yeah. The road that turns into like Sovereign Isle at the Co end, yes. like it starts off real narrow and tanny. Correct. And, uh, okay. Yes. Steve, could you remind the council what your first motion and recommendation was? It was basically to get the, this gentleman on the agenda to talk to you about this pedestrian traffic management solution. Yeah, can we see if that can be put on the agenda as soon as possible? We'll have staff reach yeah, out. Just for your information, like I say, this, the interim city manager was there. He got to hear this, so he's familiar with it. He, he heard it as well. Could you reach out to him, Lance, and go ahead and have him submit <laughs> an, an application to do a presentation? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, thanks Steve. Are we back on the original agenda now? <laughs> so we're number three, public comments on the agenda items that are not on public hearings and any other matters not on the agenda. And I have two yellow cards uh, that want to speak on non-agenda items. And after I call their names, I'll uh, look out, reach out to the public, and you can comment either on an agenda item other than public hearings or on a non-agenda item. First one is Ms. Abair. Trace Abair, 716 Main Street. Um, at the meeting of August 6, 2018, um, Ms. Ramswell made some statements about the Destin Fishing Fleet and some documents that she had um, to talking about the development agreement between the fleet and the city. And it kind of raised hairs on my arms. I was like, you know, it sounded like there was some shyster actions going on so I went and tried to find these documents between the fleet and the city and I couldn't find them couldn't find who prepared them I talked to the city they none was ever done in a long story short looking for them they they were documents in draft and I don't know if somebody gave them to you and misrepresented what they gave to you but when they were finally signed the ones that did get signed were dated two years later by Mayor Sam Sievers, and they were the actual agreements that were prepared and approved that are public record, and you can find them, and there was no shyster activity between the fleet or the city. Um, there was also the amendment to lease agreement for riparian rights, and I think that was to do with the submerged lands, and that was prepared in 2009, and it did not get signed by Mayor Barker then. It actually got signed over a year later by Mayor Sam Sievers, so that draft where the museum was in two places didn't really come to fruition. It did get rejected and was put over on Stallman Avenue. And as far as riparian rights, you have to do these every year, and it's a very expensive, timely process with the state. So I just wanted to make sure, because this was public, confusion I saw it almost a hundred different Facebook pages reposting what you had put out and I felt badly for the citizens that thought things weren't being done right so I wanted to find out for myself and found the agreements that were signed and there was proper documents done and it nobody was getting away with slips or submerged land leases a lot of this stuff to do with the museum never came to fruition and was put properly in at the place that it was supposed to be and the fleet owns the adjacent parcel that is 282 feet Dewey Destin owns 75 feet and the state of Florida owns all the riparian areas and you have to apply for the submerged land lease so I just wanted to clarify some of this because 
I know that I had people calling me thinking I, as the parks person I would know these answers and so I went and found the document so I just didn't know if somebody had misguided you ma'am or not but I felt like the citizens of Destin needed to be you know clarified so that this false information out on Facebook which so many people believe Facebook to be the law the rules the you know the real news that that was not true so that's why I wanted just to bring it thank you well, thanks for bringing that up. And um, no, nobody gave that to me. I actually got it as a result of a public records request that I did on emails within the city. And the reason it's not in public record is because the development order was not ever approved. It was an agreement that was going back and forth between Ms. Wines, the fleet, the city manager, and back and forth. And so it was presented as the genesis of what started the negotiations. And when you follow along the different drafts and the different versions you can see how it did end up the way it was and all those documents were provided to our clerk and the council and the attorney in attendance that night so they should be at some point uploaded or put wherever they put the records for the meetings yeah mm -hmm. thank you Ms. Abair uh, next up James Barnes Nope. That was all right. And Richard Christie. Put a reset in. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Richard Go ahead. Christie, 3629 Goldsby's Way. Um, my wife and I are 20 year uh, residents of Destin. I'm a 24-year retired military. For the past seven years, we've owned a property at um, 235 Pelican Place that we've used basically for friends and family when they come to visit. A couple months ago, my wife and I started investigating how we would use that as a rental property for short-term short rentals. We applied for our state license, got that, applied for the city license, paid for it, and then was called by the officer to say that that property is not zoned for short-term rental. I was then informed that I could come to the council and apply for a variance for a short-term rental license. So that's why I'm here. Address that, Jeff. Uh, no, that's not the process. Uh, if, first off, uh, I'm, you'll need to probably get with Ms. Comp. She's in charge of code enforcement, but uh, there's no process for coming before the council and asking for a variance for any sort of matter whatsoever. There's, you need to go to the community development department. They'll have various applications for you. If, if they've already made a determination that you're not eligible, then uh, they probably won't change their determination. So. But he can go before. Isn't there a board? The Board of Adjustments. There's a Board, there's a board of Adjustments that, uh, that I don't know if they're going to give you a variance so on an issue like that, but that's not even necessarily eligible to be in front of them, that type of matter. That's more of a, just a straight up code enforcement matter. I don't yeah. think that you've come to community development staff yet, so I would suggest as a first step to meet with um, or talk to Mr. Schmidt or myself after the meeting. Okay. Up until, up until uh, last year, I was the president of the Pelican Place HOA. That, that house is... Um, one of 34 in a uh, development. When the HOA rules were made, were written in 2000, they allowed for uh, no less than three days uh, short-term rental. I don't know when the code was changed. We only found out about it two months ago when we decided to apply for the application. Um, so uh, I will come and see you, I guess. Sir, where was that at again? What was the address that's, of the that's complex? That's on Wildcat Hill. It's, it's part of, uh, it's sandwiched in between Azalea and uh, Mountain Drive um, over um, yeah, it's, it's on the, the other side Hill. of Goldsby's Way. Wildcat Hill. <laughs> yeah, it's part of Wildcat Hill. Have we ever allowed short-term rentals north of 98? Um, well, when the, when the, <laughs> I was the president for four years, and so I was very familiar with the HOA rules. 
and it's still in there. So, and that was written in 2000. And I mean, the, there should have been no reason to change it. Well, like, like just the best thing to do is th this is not the place or the time. Okay. You're not going to get a variance. I was missing for them then. Council. Yeah, no problem. And, and these folks will take care of you. They'll steer you in the right direction on what the process is for you to, to press okay. on. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you, you, you can coming come, up. Sure. You can come see us and talk to us anytime. So, I mean, you know, you don't, you do need to follow the process, but feel free to come talk to your city council. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. That takes care of everybody I have on the list or public comment. Is there anyone else that would like to address any issue on the agenda or not on the agenda at this present time? Seeing none, we're going to press on. Yeah. All right. All right, 4A, Signature Authority, Resolution 18-26. Jeff. Well, I don't have to read the resolution, but the purpose of this resolution is to, since we have new uh, interim city manager, is to allow him to also sign checks and to be on the bank account. And I don't think it needs further explanation than that. Uh, Y'all are all familiar with it. So, and uh, I would recommend that you move to adopt resolution 18-26. I can, I can make that motion. I move the council adopt resolution 18-26. That's why we approved last. Okay, we have, we have a motion. I'll I'll second. Second. We got multiple seconds. Uh, any further discussion? Anybody have any comments? Seeing none, let's vote on this. Six yeses, one nay. So moved. It's on the public record, Mr. Dixon. All right. Um, 4C. Fiscal year uh, 2019 proper property and casualty insurance. This is an annual policy renewal that we have Ms. Jankowski here to answer any questions for. Does anybody have any questions uh, um, at this time, or can we start a motion? Or this, this is under the city manager report, not the consent agenda. Any, any comments, any questions? We got the man here to answer all your questions. I'm seeing none. Um, I'll entertain. What do we want to do? Do we just want to? Get a motion to. Uh, you can go make the motion, discuss if you want. Uh, there's no you, public comment was provided in the previous section or section three. And uh, if y'all need your questions answered, Mr. Jankowski is right here to answer your questions. So. Do we take action on this? Uh, there is a motion. Let, yeah, I'll, I'll make the motion. It's a long one. I move to authorize the city manager to engage Mr. Tom Connolly to bind workers' compensation insurance with the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust and to engage Mr. Paul Dawson to bind all other lines of property and casualty coverage through Preferred Governmental Insurance Trust for fiscal year 2019. We have a motion. I got a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. Unanimous, so moved. All right, Jeff. Um, we're here for the first reading of ordinance number 18-15-LC, an ordinance of the city of Destin, Florida, relating to the use of wheeled vehicles on public and private areas of the beach, providing for authority, providing for findings of fact, providing for an amendment to land development code section 11.08.02, providing for incorporation into the land development code, providing for conflicting provisions, provide for severability and provide for an effective date and this is a public hearing. I believe Ms. Kopp is best suited to answering your questions on this one. Uh, I have a question. Um, there was a letter written to the council and to the uh, myself uh, from a person that does state required maintenance and services and he has vehicle a need to have vehicles uh, for projects. Uh, most of the, that are directed by the state, and uh, that's not that provision's not in this ordinance. I think that needs to be added a special exception type uh, language in there for people that are uh, for uh, 
whether it's dune restoration or, or um, erosion control or anything like that? Well, I would say that it could be considered to be included already under the public safety vehicles provision and also the city manager can issue a permit in those circumstances. However, if the city council desires um, to have more clarification put into it, uh, you know, it's at your discretion. Yeah, and I think the motion most likely will be to bring it back, take it back to staff, and then bring it back for the second reading. And at that time, I think it'd be appropriate just go ahead and insert some language like that, just to give everybody a little clarity. Um, first, or uh, Mr. Dixon. <sighs> I um I do agree with this um but I, but I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that that it's very broad in in nature when it says first reading of ordinance wheel vehicles on the beach well is the beach is it upward of the erosion control line is it below the erosion control line where where are we saying and and we're talking about in essence private property in some cases so what we'd be saying is that you can't take a vehicle on your private property. Now, I don't know whether that's some sort of a rule in the, the um, um, you know, in the state statutes as far as where you can go on the, on the beach or the Gulf Front or the pass or wherever it may be, but I don't know that we can stop people from actually accessing their property with a vehicle of some kind. Now, I know that we can do something about vehicles being below the erosion control line or maybe in a safety corridor or whatever, but can we legally do this as far as to, to stop people from driving on their property on the beach? I'll, I'll take a first stab at it because uh, we talked about this earlier. Uh, the best analogy, Mr. Dixon, uh, when you have a swamp on your property, it's considered a wetland. If, if you if you own some property, let's say the north end of the county, you can't just fill that in and, and do whatever you want with it or the EPA or someone like that will come in and say you're destroying wetlands because it's a protected environment. Uh, when you're on the beach, the dunes, you can't just drive your uh, dune buggy around, the, uh, you know, pathing up all, tearing up all the dunes, killing all the birds and all that. So uh, it's, it's also recognized as a sensitive environment just like a wetland is. And, it, there, and there are protections in the state statutes. Uh, what is a beach? Uh, that's a question not answered in here. That, but uh, you have to use a little bit. Of, I'm not saying you individually, but the person enforcing it has to use a little bit of common sense in enforcing it. If they if they see someone out there just like driving all over the dunes, then they are clearly they're they're not just violating city ordinances. They're violating state statutes at that that point. And uh, so there there are uh, you don't just have carte blanche private property rights if you own the beach beachfront property. I, I understand very good point that you just made there with, with that, um, but let's just say you don't have to climb over dunes and sea oaks to get to that flat beach behind your house. Are we still talking the same thing? I mean, are we are are we saying that they would be damaging the beach? And hey, look, I got no issues with it, but I just wanted to make sure that we're not doing something that violating their private property rights and are basically view it as a taking or something like that. So. You know, I, I just, I just want to make sure that we're on firm ground if we go this way. But um, the 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 fact that just a, a a vehicle being on their property would be enough maybe to cite them. So I just wanted to check that. Would you like to take a shot at it too, Kim? The reasons for the ordinance uh, are in part what Jeff said, and also they're laid out in the whereas clauses having to deal with the fact that vehicles cause erosion on the beach, even if they're not on the dunes, and other adverse effects. Um, if the city council isn't comfortable with the reasoning as set forth in the ordinance now, we can provide you with additional white papers and documentation to show exactly how much damage a vehicle does to the beach and provide that type of information. Okay, I, one of the things that I would like to see is that if they're working on the beach and they do have to get equipment sometimes on the beach is that we would allow something like that if it's purely for recreational purposes I'd certainly have a problem with that but we do have to be a little bit flexible in the fact that that sometimes equipment does have to go down there for reasons and and as I said there's a difference between work and leisure and the leisure and would be to take your thing down there to be able to look at the sunset while you sit in the cab of your 
Silverado pickup truck, that's not cool enough. So anyway. Yeah. And yeah. the way it's written, though, the city manager could issue a permit in any of those circumstances. Okay, but what about for the beach services that do utilize like a small golf cart or something like that to put out their umbrellas and their chairs and stuff like that? Are we basically going to be prohibiting those people from utilizing that from, from then on? So, Unless they get a permit from the city manager. Okay. <laughs> All right, so basically... If, if it's not clear enough the way it is, we can work on it and, and put these things more specifically in the ordinance. But right now, it's yeah. all vehicles unless there's a permit issued by the city manager or if they're public safety or law enforcement. I, I'm not trying to muddy this up. I promise you I'm not. But I just want to make sure that we whatever we do is, is fair and right. And, and what we do is sometimes we jump on these things and do these things, and then we find out, oh, we forgot that. And I know we can come back and adjust these things, but... I want to make sure that whatever we do is within the law and within reason when we do it originally if we can. So, Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Brayton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I went over it. I think it's pretty clear. And if it, you know, I think it covers Mr. Dixon's concerns. If they do need to get on the beach, they can get a permit from the city manager. So I'm going to uh, make the recommended motion. I move that the city council approve ordinance 18-15-LC on first reading and direct staff to schedule a second reading for final adoption. Okay, I got a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. second for discussion. I got a second. And speaking of discussion, Ms. Ramswell, you're next. Thanks. Yeah, I, my concerns are in the same scope as uh, Mr. Dixon's. I'm worried about the folks that are out there that are, especially the end of the season, beginning of the season, bringing the chairs and the umbrellas up. What about the folks that are doing the trash? Um, you know that sort of a thing maintenance repair it would be pretty burdensome for them to have to ask for a permit every time they went down maybe if it was a one-time thing I, I don't know or maybe just some exception for maintenance repair I, I, I don't know but I think that's something we need to look at trying to clarify I think as it's currently written they could probably get an ongoing type of a permit from the city manager but if the council desires that to be explicitly addressed in the ordinance, we can also revise it. So it's at y'all's discretion. I'll see what the rest of the council thinks. All right, Mr. Marler, and then I think we'll bring this into a vote. All right, I'm going to have a lot of heartburn on this because I still believe that we are stepping on private property rights because we're telling people they can't traverse on their own property in a technical sense. And uh, Ms. Copp, you and I had our conversation and Steffi alluded to that is where what what is defined as the beach where does the beach end and the private property begins because it, it actually ties in a little bit to our uh, little 20-foot setback thing that we're arguing about uh, for the another meeting and the other thing is is that where how did this ordinance come about where did it come from because usually um, we used to have a policy that we had to have a council member that sponsored an ordinance that we were coming forward with I'm just curious to how this ordinance came about from your boss driving on the beach <laughs> well that's fine if but uh, that to be okay I, I, will, I will take that but I will say I will say this that I will say this much you know without getting upset about it I you know what he does and what, what he does I don't you know, it's not my concern as long as I get a paycheck I, I, I earn a paycheck that's all I'm looking for but he uh, if we want to but then this is this brings up a legal issue we're targeting and secondly because he's not the only person that I know of I know of three other properties on Holiday Isle and, and I know two owners that have approached me about the same situation and they're not happy you know they, I, they're not here to come forward because they're out of, you know they're not in they're not residents but they own property on Holiday Isle and they have done the same identical thing but to me if you're 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 targeting and I think you're in for a lot we're in for a lot of trouble because I think in for, you know forgetting about who the who the property is we're stepping on private property rights no matter who it is all right guys let's go ahead um, we've got a, a motion we've got a second let's take this to vote it's a mayor um, um, mayor excuse me it's public hearing sir oh yes all right we got a couple of people that want to speak, so step up. 
And Come I'm going to hold every I'm going to hold everybody three minutes. That's right. That's quick. <laughs> three golf breeze court. So I want to explain uh, a situation that occurs at where I live on Gulf Breeze Court during Hurricane Opal and Hurricane Ivan. The Gulf of Mexico and the harbor became one because my road was the river, and that's because there were no sand dunes there. They were blown away, destroyed during Opal, I suppose, and then Ivan. So it's been a lot of years that those have been brought back up. And the owner of that parcel not only drives out to the beach for their own recreational use, and I won't even get into the turtles, but as you drive over those dunes for your pleasure, you are breaking down the sand dunes that protect not just my property, but everybody who else who owns on that street. So this isn't just about going out to the beach for recreational use. There's a private property owner that drives all over several different vehicles that drive all over those sand dunes out there. So, and there is a corridor that's there that's been provided for uh, beach service guys and uh, uh, emergency vehicles. That's not an issue. It's there, it's been there, but it's the driving over. So I think you guys would, should be aware that that does happen out there. And then of course, I'll always support the turtles. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next. Thanks, everybody. Um, I support uh, this ordinance. I just feel it's um, a little hasty and it's a little not specific. Um, for beach services, I heard they can't, the city manager can issue a permit. They might issue a permit. Sometimes we don't know who the city manager is. Sometimes we don't know who the city staff is because. So um, I would like to see it written a little more specifically, and I would also like um, what we did for the corridor, maybe bring the people with vested interest involved and hear our concerns specifically, maybe in a less formal setting um, before this uh, comes up again, maybe hear some of our input um, that have to deal with this daily. So noted, appreciate it. That's what I was alluding to earlier. We just need some clearer language to address these type of issues that he just brought up because that relying on issue permit from city manager, um, it's not, not knowing who the city manager is, but it's the case that it does give ambiguity of who's going to get one and who's not. And I would like some clarity in that. Go ahead. Um, do you want to wait on the vote while you're asking that, Kyron? Rodney, would you consider amending your motion to simply tabling this issue and allowing them to input some specificity with regards to the beach service folks and some of the... It? Would you be willing to entertain perhaps amending it to a, to a tabled motion? Because I, I could support it if it had more specificity. How about to a time certain instead of tabling? Sure. I, I'm going to ask Rodney. It's his motion. So, Does that give you enough time? So, so you're going to amend your motion, uh, time certain, to um, that would be September 17th? Well, actually, we'd have LPA first. It's a land development code. Is that good? To the first meeting in October. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we have a motion. We have a second. We have to go back to the LPA for a minor change like that, you think? I guess it depends what the changes are, but if we're going to change it significantly. Because uh, wouldn't that just be expanding the rights for some people of the public? Is it, that's the only thing I was thinking. We could skip the LPA since it's making it less restrictive well, by I, adding a class. If it's going to go October, the first week in October, there will be an LPA meeting in between anyway. So it's not really a delay. All right. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and vote on this. Unanimous. So moved. All right. Now we're at consent agenda. Nope, save. Oh, yeah. First reading of ordinance 18-16-LC uh, vested right process. Jeff? Ordinance number 18-16-LC in ordinance of the city of Destin, Florida, amending Article 2 of the Land Development Code to establish a process for vested rights determinations, provide for intent, provide for eligibility to apply for a vested rights determination, 
provide for application requirements, application categories, and application procedures, provide for appeals, provide for ultra virus protections, provide for notice to the state, provide for authority, provide for incorporation into the land development code, provide for conflicting provisions, provide for severability, and provide for an effective date. And this is first reading in the public hearing. I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing at this time. Anybody like to comment on the first reading of this particular ordinance? Come on up, sir. My name is John Snell. Um, I live at 2688 Spring Lake Road in the great city of Defuniac Springs. My client, uh, Affordable Banquets, has a project that is in the development order process right now. And um, I understood from the staff, the Destin staff, and from your consultant that was reviewing the development order that the building required a 5 on 12 slope or greater, up to 12 on 12 slope, that a flat roof was not allowed, that parapets were not allowed, um, and I thought that was quite unusual, so I called um, uh, Ms. Brila, is it Brila or Brila, and asked her about it, and she said, well, I've written an uh, ordinance that is going in front of the city council that will address this so that if you are designing a building, which I have been for the last seven months, with a flat roof and parapets, which is what I've been designing, that uh, there would be some relief from the uh, comprehensive plan. And she also mentioned that, that the comprehensive plan and the land development code are um, in disagreement or in conflict, I guess, over, over this. The land development code does allow <coughs> parapets, flat roofs, as well as sloped roofs. Uh, so I would encourage uh, the council to vote in favor of this ordinance. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any further comment? All right. I will entertain a motion at this point. I'll speak at once. It's been a long time. Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and make the recommended motion that we adopt ordinance number 18-16-LC, vested rights process. Second. We got a motion. We got a second. Is there any further discussion on this? I got a question. Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Dixon. Uh, Kimberly, would the issue that this gentleman just brought up, would this be even addressed in this? Not unless he's previously applied for a DO or has an annexation agreement or fits into one of the three categories. Um, but I'm not aware of the issue he brought up tonight. I've, I've never had it discussed with me by anyone on staff. I'm not sure if Mr. Schmidt um, knows about it, but Ms. Bryla is no longer with the city. Okay, uh, we need to steer the gentleman to the to the right person, to Mr. Steve Schmidt, I guess. Um, no, Mr. Steve Schmidt. That's yeah. This this gentleman here. Um, if you, sir, could maybe get with him after the meeting and exchange phone numbers. But I don't know that what we're doing here is going to take care of your issue. But anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a motion. We have a second. Seeing no further discussion, let's vote. Uh, unanimous eyes have it so moved. All right, where are we? Consent agenda. Is there? There's nothing on the consent agenda, if I remember right. So. Um, and thank you so much, Mr. Morgan, for setting aside your deal. Um, we'll start from left to right. Comments presentation from the Mayor, Council, and Land Use Attorney, City Attorney. First up, Mr. Braden. Uh, the only thing I got tonight, Mayor, is for uh, Lance Johnson. I hope the first check you cut your $10,000 bonus you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got tonight. Do you want him to share some of that with you? Is that what the intent of that comment was? <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Braden. Ms. Ramswell. Yes, I 
Okay. Um, so just real briefly tonight, I know that this past week I was at the Florida League of Cities annual conference, and so is Mr. Skip over here. And it was just a great opportunity for us to network and meet with other folks, elected officials and staff from around the state. And home rule is one of their number one overall arching uh, topics and we talked about it at length and how really we're going to be working with the legislature this year to maintain home rule and prevent um, a, a lot of the different bills that they're trying to send through that take away from home rule and, and put the state in charge of a lot of things. So um, it was a great conference and uh, I'm always pleased and, and honored to be able to represent the city, Adam. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramswell. Uh, Mr. Dixon. Said enough tonight. Thank you. You have. <laughs> you beat me. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's needed, Mayor. We, no way to keep up, though. Thank you for your service, Mr. Dixon. Thank you for your service. Is all I have to say, uh, Mr. Overdeer. I just did all what Dr. Ramswell said. And thank you for attending as well. In fact, Ms. Ramswell, uh, I guess you did a presentation. Uh, you, you, you spoke I was at? asked to be on a panel, and um, it was sort of a question and answer panel regarding short term rentals and the different legislation that's been presented and different ways cities can work together to try to prevent some of those issues taking away home rule in the instance of vacation rental homes. Cool. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, Mr. Marler. Uh, I had a couple issues, but I've got to do a little more research. I'll get back with that, so nothing tonight. Thank you. Mr. Dustin. Uh, nothing really tonight other than um, this council appointed you to go and get some information and explore uh, potential properties for acquisition for public beach. Um, and I'm here as a supporter of that. And I actually got handed a card by the president of the Capri Homeowners Association. So I'm going to pass that off to you and uh, get the information to Jeff. So if you guys would reach out to him, I believe he's in town until Wednesday. So... I that's, will take care of that. That's, uh, that's one to look into. I got to be late, laid up in an MRI for a couple hours tomorrow morning, but I'll deal with that on my way back from Tallahassee. And Jeff, um, I'm sure I'm still waiting with bated breath, pun intended, um, on on trying to get a meeting with our um, um, friends at Holiday Inn. She, she, su she summons me. I don't summon her. Let's put it that way. So. All right. Well, keep keep gently knocking on that door and I am a, um, I'm taking a $10 tour of some properties on Wednesday so uh, hopefully at the next council meeting uh, I'll have something to bring back to people of some of our options and like I said Jeff let's just keep ringing that bell as long as we can um, thanks council Mayor I have, I have nothing else okay thank you Mr. Destin Mr. Morgan you're thank done you. uh, thank you Mayor we have some very serious issues going on on our beach and with code enforcement but um with the season winding down uh and the pace at which this city sometimes moves i don't see the harm in delaying it another couple of weeks thanks appreciate that and we'll, we'll put that on maybe just make that an agenda item maybe you can do a presentation with with some of your concerns and we'll approach it from that set that way i will do that all right sounds great um i have nothing to say which is i know yeah yeah just i'm glad everybody's sitting down uh land use attorney kim as you all know we had an executive session scheduled for tonight that was canceled so i am looking to reschedule it so if i could um, make the announcement and then have you all determine a date um, i desire advice concerning following litigation and i'm requesting an executive session to be held at a time and date to be determined by the city council uh, council possibly 5 p.m. on September 5th for your consideration or another date um, and regarding the following case BI Inc Dewey Destin Harborside LLC plaintiff versus City of Destin Florida defendant in the Circuit County Court of the First Judicial Circuit in and for Okaloosa County Florida case 2016 CA 003672F subject matter of the meeting will be confined to settlement negotiations or strategy sessions related to litigation expenditures and the entire session shall be recorded by a certified court reporter the executive session would be attended um, by all of the council members except for uh, mr parker destin due to conflict as well as attended by william warner the litigation attorney for the city myself and lance johnson the interim city manager um i think that would be september 4th 
Tuesday before the city council meeting or no? It's on the 5th, a Wednesday. Yeah, because of budget. Yeah, because we have budget budget budget. budget. All right. So do I have a motion? Do we, we need a motion to, to set up the executive? You don't have to have do a motion, but it's a better practice to do so. All right. Got a, mo got a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. We got a second. All in favor? Mayor, I got to abstain. I know you do. So moved. Eyes have it. All right, Mr. City Attorney. Um, real quick before I hit the Gulf Power stuff up, uh, I did, there's actually a state statute covering vehicles on the beach, uh, except for five counties. We're not one of the five counties. And it defines beach as the zone of unconsolidated material that extends landward from the mean low water line to the place where there is marked change in material or physiographic form or to the line of permanent vegetation. And usually the effective limit of storm waves and then storm waves are defined in other sources as like a major hurricane so the storm surge that comes in so i think the beaches in question probably would fall within that uh, but uh go. going on the gulf power uh the uh I, and i talked to the gulf power representatives earlier this week and i told them that uh we wouldn't be up here kind of belaboring the point but we're one month out from the deadline to either exercise that option or get an extension from them we have a meeting set up this friday uh, an informational meeting at that time that they're going to at their offices just meet with us and explain to us their current situation if uh if i hope that uh they get some good news if they do then we can maybe set up a meeting the next week and actually hear and maybe negotiate something with them but uh, uh i'll be coming back in the next meeting with the resolution that we drafted almost six or seven months ago to exercise the option just so you all approve of the form of it for the next meeting because that next meeting you'll, you will have to either exercise that option or enter into an extension agreement will that meeting be public notice friday's meeting it's, it's not because I, he has negotiation authority stripped from him at the last meeting he's only doing fact finding at this point so it's at gold powers headquarters actually so. okay yeah. so we've changed the dynamic on Correct. the negotiation aspect it's not negotiating we're, we're, we're going there to get a presentation from them so. okay yeah. and you'll be there mr destin yeah. and mr burns and uh chef Wright. okay too, yeah and nobody else from the city no one else from city you you come along mayor if you want that's but actually no that that would create an issue if uh so you can't come so, yeah. oh never mind yeah. i trust you guys <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody's had their say and I'm going to adjourn this meeting.